hit him twice. Thank you for taking time to come out and join us today. This is his second final public hearing. Three ordinances. I want to address them in this order. Start with the LDR first. We'll address the Leave No Trace second. Close out with the RV ordinance. Attorney, you ready? Good evening, Commissioners. Thank you. LDR now. Yes, sir. Um, back on um, January 5th, the first advertisement for these public hearings was run in the News Herald. Uh, it was consistent with Florida Statute 125. The second advertisement ran on the 19th of January. As you all, commissioners, know, on the 13th of January, you had your first public hearing on the advertised uh, proposed ordinances. Um, consistent with the Florida Statute, one was scheduled for the night, barring a special vote of the commission, and that's why we're gathering tonight at 501 for the public's participation. Um, the first uh, ordinance for the second public hearing this evening, and I'm going to read it by title if I have permission of the commission, um, it reads as follows. It's an ordinance of Gulf County, Florida, per the requirements of Florida Statute 163, subsection 3201, to adopt land development regulations and the requirements of Florida Statute 163 for the land development regulations to be consistent with the adopted comprehensive plan, providing for repeal or severability modifications that may arise from consideration at the public hearing and providing for an effective date. Uh, commissioners, you each have a copy of that land development regulation amendment in front of you, and I will... Um, I'll try to restate uh, the general comments that I provided to you all on January 13th. Um, over the holiday break, um, the administrator, the administration, the planning department, myself, uh, worked with the Article 2 to try to provide both the uh, community with further clarification as to the process and the authority for both the county and the planning board. Uh, historically, as it's referenced, and in the actual amendments, anything that's underlined is added. Anything that has a strike through is deleted. Um, and as you go through and as you've all reviewed it, um, the additions and the clarifications restate the authority that rests with you all as the Board of County Commissioners for development orders. And the Planning Development and Review Board is an advisory and a recommendation body, advisory board for you all to review these development applications. Um, the changes are for further clarity, um, consistent with the original LDRs that were adopted over 20 years ago. So I'll be happy to answer any questions and following the board's comments, if you would please open it to the public for the second public hearing. Any questions from the board? Um, Mr. Chairman? Yes. Uh, I don't have a question, but I do have, I would like to renew my comments that I made at the first reading of this ordinance. I won't go through them all as I did at the last meeting, and um, the, the board was not interested in entertaining those changes. But I, I will renew that I believe while we are making changes to these LDRs, I don't have a problem with the changes we've made, but I think that we need to make some additional changes. We need to tighten up the process regarding uh, variances and minor replats. And the existing LDRs have resulted in litigation against this county. And to me, this is the time for us to do the work and clean up the language. At this time, we're going to the public. This is on the LDR now. Anyone wishes, I have one here on RV, we'll get to forward. They can be ready. <coughs> do what? Anyone in the back? We're addressing the LDR, the final law, the public hearing on the LDR. If anyone out in the hallway uh, wishes to come before the board, you're welcome. Let me say this. If, if someone comes up, and I've seen this happen a lot of times, and they say basically, well, I don't, we don't need to hear. We will, necessarily. We're not denying anybody. There's no point going over the same thing three or four times. So... Uh, if we have some people there, let's, all that does just cause more confusion. So at this time, the floor is open for anyone that wants to make any comments or address any issues on the LDR. Anyone? Anyone? 
I wouldn't. Do what? You do? Wait, we got anyone in the audience? I need to, I need to. But somebody's got to. You do, all right? Come on. Couldn't tell if he was. I thought everybody was asleep for a minute there when you asked who had comments. Uh, Tom Brady. 8513 Trade Winds Drive, Fort St. Joe, Florida, which is actually I live on the beach. I want to I want to open the discussion with you, uh, and I'm expressing my opinion and a little bit of history, but I just wanted to discuss it. Referencing where Commissioner Bryan just said, there's a history which got us to this point, and the history goes back to a nine foot variance on a nine and a half foot setback out on a beach in front of Veterans Park. We're all aware of that. Read the paper. We saw the lawsuit. And the judge came back and said, it's quashed for procedural issues and so on. He listed a few things he thought were questionable, but said, I'm not going to rule on those right now. I want you to go back to the PDRB and go through the process correctly, and you'll come up with what I think is probably legal. I added that. But you'll come up with a, with a reasonable approach as variance. My issue then and my issue now in looking at this is the PDRB rules and the thing that those, those points which allow them to grant an exception to the LDRs are so general, you ought to not have an LDR. You don't need a PRDB. You ought to not have LDRs. And specifically what I want to talk about is, the point I want to make is, and everybody out here should pay attention to this issue, if you can grant a nine-foot variance to a nine and a half foot setback, why have them? Why have setbacks? Why have a process? If the law allows you to do that, this, in my opinion, this LDR and the rules for a variance is kind of like the Constitution, state or federal. It allows things to happen, but it doesn't allow the government to do whatever it wants to do. It's bound by the same rules and the same laws, the same issues that everybody else is. That's, what, that's why when your LDR spells out possible reasons for variance, it used to say and, 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 and. You've written it to where it says or, 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 which is how you got the nine-foot variance on a nine-foot, half-foot setback to start with. Now, this deals right now with the particular area of St. Joe Beach. And I understand that. That's the way it is. If you live on Cape Sandblast, I will refer you a quick, quick thought back to about six years ago when a group of people, I'll call them the cabal, but anybody can call them what they want to, came in here and tried to get the density changed on Cape Sandblast. You're next, Cape Sandblast. If you live on Cape Sandblast, and you think that granting a nine-foot variance on a nine-and-a-half-foot setback on St. Joe Beach isn't a precedent that you're all going to see in the coming years. These are desirable properties. It's going to happen if, we, if, if these LDRs okay. go this flexible. Now, God's sorry. Right. One more. you out of time. Ah. Uh, motion, okay. to, motion to extend. Do you need time? Uh, I have. I think we probably. Hey, we've got, I, I can. You got point. my gist, right? Yes, I think so. And, and, and we're all this aware. is a, this I, is a I, serious I, issue. Very serious. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Colonel Graney. Okay. Anyone else? Barbara Radcliffe, I'll be a little brief, more brief than Tom was. By changing the ands to ors, he's correct. You might as well not have it because you're going to make a variance the rule, not the exception. And um, this will come back to bite you. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? My name 
name is John Arnold. I'm from 9318 West Highway 98, Beacon Hill. I just got a question on how you can deny a variance and give a variance, deny somebody else a variance. I mean, what gives these people, they purchase this property. These properties, when you purchase a piece of property on your deed, it has restrictions. And the county has their ordinances or their building regulations. When they purchased a piece of property, they should have done their research and found out what the restrictions are. And when they do their planning, most of the time when somebody buys a piece of property, they have a plan in mind. They need to do their research on their plan and on their property that they're purchasing and making sure that piece of property is adequate for what they're purchasing it for, for their plan. If it's not, they need to buy a piece of property somewhere else that is. And, I mean, that just stands in general to me. I'm not picking out anybody that's got one, anybody that hasn't got one. I'm not referring to any of that. I'm just talking about it as a whole. Thank you, John. Thank you, Mr. Arnold. Thank you. LDR. What else? Sir, come up. Commissioners, my name is James Bellisbach. I live at 8674 Highway 98 Port, Beacon Hill. My view from my lot overlooks Beacon Hill Park, the park and also the beach. And the piece of ground that we're talking about, I think, is the one that you're going to allow somebody to build up six inches within the park. I think that that is actually horrific. Okay? I'm a veteran. It's a veteran's park, and it shouldn't be allowed. It's just my opinion. No, sir. It's a public park. It bears the name veterans. It does. Public park. Are you? And? Public park. It's open to the public. It is. We named it after our veterans that served this county and this country. Well, thank you very much for the clarification. Okay. But still, to allow somebody to build within six inches of that public park, a veterans park, is not right. That's just my opinion. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you. Yeah, Commissioners, we have four public comment, but I'd just take you all to page, or actually section 2.0507, if each of the Commissioners can turn to that section in the LDRs. I'll come back, but I want to go to this attorney first. Um, I just, it's section 2.0507. It is specifically with regards to variances. Um, you've had public comment and um, some inaccurate statements made with regards to our current law and what you're proposing to do now. So I want to make very clear for the Commission and the public what your current law is. And I'm going to read your current law. It says, a variance from the terms of these regulations shall not be granted by the Planning Development Review Board unless and until the following requirements or procedures are met. A written application for a variance is submitted to the Planning Building Department demonstrating that a hardship exists based on one of the following conditions. That is your current law. Under 2.0507, it now reads as follows. A variance from the terms of these regulations shall be heard, reviewed, and recommendations submitted by the Planning Development Review Board to the Board of County Commissioners for final action after the following requirements and procedures are met. A written application for a variance is submitted to the Planning Building Department demonstrating that a hardship exists based on one of the following conditions. 34A has not changed. It's the exact same language as the laws currently exist. You go down to sections 1 and 2, and the preposition of the word or has been placed to further clarify the sentence above that says it's based on one of the following conditions, not all four. The word and has not been removed, and nor was it previously in there. It simply adds the word or to sections 1 and 2, and it was previously on number 3. That was the current law, and what's been added now is to add that additional preposition, but there has not been any words and removed, 
and it currently does not require that they all be met. It simply says that one of the following conditions be met. As I mentioned in my opening remarks, the staff's efforts were to further clarify your current laws. There is not an attempt by the planning department that I'm aware of in speaking with Mr. Lowry, Mr. Lowry and Mr. Richardson to change the intent of this commission. As you go through the 20 so pages in the LDRs of Article 2, you'll see it's restated numerous times over. Historically, for the last 20 years, this Board of County Commissioners has asked an advisory board to review development order applications and provide their recommendations to you. You consistently have done that, you continue to do that, and this Board of County Commissioners make the final decision. There was a challenge last year, and it was quashed, the variance that was spoken of. I don't want to get into particulars or details because we're here about the LDRs. It was sent back for procedural deficiencies, a lack of due, a due process, and a quasi-judicial setting. The legal merits of your LDRs were not addressed other than you didn't have proper due process. The LDRs in Article 2 now state numerous times that the PDRB is an advisory board only, and you five elected officials make a determination on development orders in Gulf County. That's what you've done for the past 20 years, and that's what's currently in Article 2 to continue on. So I'd be happy to answer any questions about variance section. Go back out here. Yeah. I just needed to ask a question um, about what was just stated. I mean, come on up and give me that, and then we can all. Sorry. I didn't know if it was permissible for me to holler from the back. But no, no, no. Come on up. That's fine. That's fine. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Jennifer Corbin, 9106, all about the new Beacon Hill. Um, just on the, the – um, what, what you just read to us about the existing law, um, I, I think when, when we were all kind of digesting what was going on with the variance in Beacon Hill, I, I thought I understood that at, at some point um, in fourth quarter of either 2013, maybe the, the LDR was changed. And I'm just wondering, you know, for the sake of us, you know, that are obviously anguished by this, um, could you help us understand what those previous changes to the LDR were? I understand what, the, what it is today. What was it prior, and in what time frame did that change? Sure. Uh, Mr. Tarney, do you want to address that? Yeah, I, I can. Oh, I can try. <laughs> I just say, Ms. Corbin, um, the county received a grant over two and a half years ago for the planning department to take a technical review and evaluation and conduct various public hearings. I don't have it in front of me, and I don't know of all the LDRs, what was changed, what wasn't. But I know that they were provided a grant. The planning department worked on those revisions, and they're, they're available as part of public records. So I, I couldn't comment specifically about what was and wasn't changed. But they, I think they had uh, three planning board public hearings and then two county commission public hearings. There's five public hearings on the revisions over two and a half years ago that were required by the grant. They were all notified and advertised. And I don't know, Dave, I mean, there's over, I think, about 300 pages, so I don't know specifically, Ms. Corbin. I couldn't comment on one particular change. Yeah, I, my, my only concern is, you know, that the comments that I'm hearing, you know, from other folks that have come forward, you know, seem to, to point out some of the, the potential um, minefields that exist if, if we accepted the LDRs and where, you know, say, you know, hey, it's, it's, you know, you don't need to qualify under multiple conditions. You only need to qualify under one. Is, is that a good policy, and does, does that serve us all well? Sure. I can. I, and, Chairman, I'd say, Ms. Corbin, um, in my five years, short five years, I'm aware of one challenge legally, that judicial review last year. Prior to that, I'm not aware of any under uh, – County Attorney McFarland. So in the better part of 19 years, I'm unaware of a challenge to the LDRs for that interpretation. The county acts as a quasi-judicial body, mm -hmm. which means they are the judge, the five folks up here. Right. And for the past 19 years, they've made that judgment, taking the facts and the applications and applying the county law. And this five is given that authority by statute. They apply the law. And so every fact pattern that comes in, they will apply it and make it a judgment or an interpretation. So if there's a a plea for a hardship under the current LDRs, these five elected officials make that final decision that they're allowed to by law. That has happened for 19 years. What we've done in Article 2 is reinforced that they have the authority, not the planning board, because it was challenged saying the planning board has that authority, when in fact the county has made that decision historically for the past two decades. That will continue if this is adopted the way it is. 
I understand what you've, what you've told me, and, and I guess my only comment, you know, to our lawmakers here is yeah. that, you know, we, I'm sorry. Oh, that, that we, you know, have identified, you know, the opportunity where what sounds like, you know, good policy, you know, could turn very bad based on how it's applied to an individual parcel condition. So, you know, I, I, I for one, um, would like to uh, defer any decision on the LDR until we've had a chance, you know, to work through the language again. Um, I think we can get to something that's agreeable for everybody and something that feels equitable for everybody. But I, I think the way the LDR is stated today, um, that there is an opportunity for uh, uh, well, I'm struggling for the for the correct words, um, but um, damage to be done to to uh, the the layout of, of some of our very pristine properties. And I'd like us to be very cautious about those resources and how they're developed and make sure that what we provide for Gulf County is something that's very pleasing and that our development is thoughtful. So thank you. Uh, thank you. Done? Um, uh, just no? in, in oh, okay. going with um, what Ms. Going along with what uh, Ms. Corbin has said, under this particular LDR for the variance as it's written and as regardless of what the change is, if it's um, just clarifying, the issue is the way it's written. If, if someone makes a change to their property and it's their own actions, but it results in something that's peculiar to that piece of property, under this language, they qualify for a variance. And I don't see how we can deny a variance in that situation because they qualify. So if I do something to my property and I make it different than the properties around me, even though I did it myself, I qualify for a variance. And that's my issue. My, my specific issue is with um, Number three, that the special conditions of circumstances do not result from the actions of the applicant. That, that should be, in any case, if it results from your own actions, then you should not qualify for a variance. And to me, that's the issue. Really, anyone would qualify. the point, but, but I think that, that, that the, the and or the or got really fouled up in this situation. If, if we follow the, the basic text that Commissioner Bryan brought up that you don't want to, then you're going to eliminate 90 some odd percent of the variances. And let me give you an example. A Gulf County didn't adopt a comp plan until 1992. Adopted LDRs in 1994. The vast majority of existing homes and structures and buildings in Gulf County do not meet the current LDRs. I live in a house that was built in 1956. If I decided to sell that house to Mr. Novak tomorrow, I'll never get a title policy to give Mr. Novak until I get a variance. You know why? I've got three sheds, one a pump shed and two sheds that are built right on the line. And my next door neighbor's house is built right on the line. There are hundreds, thousands of examples of folks that do not meet the current LDRs. Some sheds were built 10 years ago, some were built 50 years ago. So if you, if you, if you change the wording, just like the attorney said, we're not changing the wording, we're clarifying the wording. If you change the wording that you have to meet all four criteria, not one of the four, which is, is what it's always been and what it is today, then you'll give no after the fact variances. You won't be able to give variances just like you voted on two weeks ago to somebody who inadvertently built their shed too close to the line, there was confusion, it was an honest mistake, those type of things. So it can't be you meet all four or you'll never have a variance. You're elected to make decisions, and it's always a political decision. You, you weigh the balance, and that's the, that's the facts of life. If, if it was a straight law, we'd have no planning board, we'd have no decisions whatsoever. Everybody would be black and white, and everybody would be in trouble in Guff County. We have to deal with what we have, and we've only had an LDR for the last 21 years. So there are a lot of properties that will have to have variances in the future as people die, as people sell, and things of that nature. I just want to clarify that. It would be impossible 
to meet all four criteria and ever get a variance on existing property that's built illegally. And Mr. Chairman, yes. this board should not be making political decisions for people asking for variances. It should be an even playing field, and you should know what the rules are, and the board should be applying the rules. We shouldn't make decisions for on variances based on politics. It should not be a political decision. And there is a time frame. We have existing places that have been around for a very long time. And you can have a time frame cut off. You can deal with this in different ways. But this exists now and going forward. So if I go out and do it tomorrow, I, you know, I want to put that shed in the setback. I'm just going to do it. And next year, I'll ask for a variance. It's already there. So it, this is not helping our community as we move forward. Okay, I'll entertain one more LDR, one more from the audience. Okay, closes to the public on the LDR. <clears throat> Wishes of the board. Yeah, Mr. Chairman. Yes, sir. I'd like to go back and address, like we did at the last board meeting, we have an attorney that spent an awful lot of time putting this together. We paid him. That's true. We've spent basically for the past 19 years following these LDRs. As far as I know, I've been on the board almost 16 years. We've only had one issue, and this is the one that's come up on St. Joe Beach. Um, I think the attorney has done an excellent job with this. There's, there's avenues that we can take down the road and modify this as we go along. But for right now, I'm satisfied. And I'm going to put a motion on the table that would support our attorney with what he drew up. And let's move forward with this. Clarify your motion. You're putting a motion on the floor to accept this LDR. All right, motion by Commissioner McElmore. All right, do I have a second to that motion? You have a second. Got a second here by Commissioner uh, Yeager. Was any discussion, any board discussion? I have one comment. Sure. This has nothing to do with support for our attorney. Our attorney drafts what we ask him to draft from a legal perspective. He assures that it is a legally proper document, but he serves at the will of the board. And the people elect us. I don't think Mr. Novak would look at it any differently. And I don't think he takes his drafting Personally, when we're discussing making a substantive change, I'm not saying this is drafted in poor legalese. It's about the substance. It's not about the legal drafting. So it has nothing to do with supporting or not supporting the attorney. I, I just think he's done an awful good job with this, putting this together. It's been very hard and very hard getting the balance. And I think he's come up with a with a good plan for this. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to support what he's got out there. Here. Just along those lines, in terms of pride of authorship, it, as I mentioned over the holidays, it was the planning department with your administrative staff. I worked in conjunction with them, as I do with everything that comes through, um, and this is a team effort, as it is with everything. Um, and like I said at the last meeting, your LDRs have evolved over the past two decades, so it is not something that just happened since December till now. This document represents really the history of land development regulations in the county for the past okay. 20 years. The second point um, with regards to your LDRs, if the county, as you indicated, Commissioner Bryan, wish to instruct us to do further revisions, we just need that direction as a staff and we go back in. It's at Article 1, whatever article, and we just need the directive of this uh, board. And if you tell us to do that, we'll go back and work further. All right, thanks, sir. Any further board discussion? Before we go for the board, any further public discussion? Public for the board discussion. All for the vote. Any opposition to the motion? I oppose. Right. Any further opposition? Not. Motion passed four to one. Okay. Just a question. I understood the 
we, we've already had the vote, Tom. It's done. Wait, did you did you just vote to to pass the LDR as it is? Yeah. I thought you had to have three hearings, two hearings and a third one. You follow the statute, sir. Exactly. All right. The next uh, public comments will be on the. We're going to address the leave no trace. Everyone, and that if not, we're going to. Attorney, I'll address it right now for you. Sure. Mr. Chairman, the uh, second public hearing this evening is on leave no trace uh, at the direction of the chairman, and it was also advertised in the same public notice in the News Herald. But please, the chair, uh, the attorney has the floor. Let's show respect. On January 5th and January 19th, uh, in compliance with Florida Statute 125, with permission of the board, I will read it by title. Okay. The ordinance reads as follows, as ordinance, an ordinance of Gulf County, Florida, prohibiting and regulating obstructions and personal property abandoned on the public beaches of Gulf County, Florida, and to be commonly referred to as Gulf County Leave No Trace Ordinance, requiring the posting of proper notice and signage at beach access points and in daily, weekly, and monthly rental units in Gulf County, Florida. For said policies to be amended, be codified, and become part of Gulf County Land Development Regulations, providing for the repeal or severability modification that may arise from consideration at these public hearings and providing for an effective date. Uh, commissioners, um, the better part of the past two years, starting with your Tourist Development Council and public comment, have uh, seen an uh, increased discussion and recommendations to you all to prepare and, and consider an ordinance on regulating abandoned property on your beaches throughout Gulf County. Um, you've instructed the staff to work through this issue. Um, they've had several committee meetings. We've worked in your Tourist Development Council. There's been town hall and workshops through the TDC. Um, and we had our first public hearing on the ordinance in front of you all on January 13th. Um, it was the goal of the staff that I've worked with to get something in front of you all so that you have something on your books prior to March, your spring break visitors and the start of the tourist season. What you have is an ordinance um, prepared um, and since the last meeting, I took the opportunity to um, take the comments that you all had provided to me as well as the public comment. And then in addition, you had a public hearing before your planning board yesterday. And over that course of a more than an hour, the planning board offered additional comments as well. Um, I've incorporated your comments as well as the planning boards into um, a highlighted version addressing three sections that you touched on at your last hearing. So I'll provide those to the commissioners. I'll touch on those first so we can review those, and then I'd ask for you to open up to public comment, um, and I'll provide them to you now. Just as a general statement, Commissioners, um, in addition to the uh, abandoned property for the benefit of the community that's here tonight for the public hearing, if this is the first time they're attending, um, some areas of focus uh, beyond abandoned property an hour after sunset until sunrise each day is the period which is defined as the um, time you cannot leave abandoned property on the beaches. Um, you heard public testimony at your last hearing um, of over 100,000 pounds of trash collected by county officials in the past year. Um, to address those issues, um, there's language created that gives the county the ability to collect abandoned property if it's classified as such on our beaches and bring it into the county campus and dispose of it. Um, while we've gone through those public discussions and town hall meetings and committees, other areas of focus um, in the county were the driving on beaches. And at your last meeting, we introduced the language that amends your current beach driving ordinance through this ordinance, which now prohibits driving permits being issued to non-county residents or non-county uh, property owners uh, so that weekly pass or permit that could be purchased in the past would be prohibited by this new ordinance amendment. Uh, in addition to that, other areas that have been covered now that there will be an ordinance that says no longer there is allowed to have glass on our county beaches. If you dig holes, you have to cover them back up and leave it at the grade that you came that same day. Camping on Gulf County beaches shall be prohibited within 400 feet of a structure. Uh, in addition, uh, open fires 
in the county will be prohibited within 100 feet of any structure, and that includes boardwalks. Uh, in addition to those, there is also a solicitation or soliciting and canvassing for commercial purposes on the beaches. Aside from our Sheriff's Department, county officials, and the TDC, it's prohibited for uh, soliciting or canvassing on our beaches for the visitors and our residents. There's a sound amplification and a quiet enjoyment provision. Uh, also, a breach of the peace um, and disorderly conduct. And it's an extension of currently what we have on our books. Uh, there's a provision with no removal of sand from our beaches. And then the last component, which is um, what the TDC and the staff are striving for in the coming years, as this is hopefully uh, in some shape or fashion adopted by this commission, would be an educational campaign. So under Section 17 and 18, your TDC, if this is adopted, will be required to go out and each year conduct a campaign to educate the public and the visitors on what our Leave No Trace ordinance requires. In addition to that, there's a provision where our vacation rental businesses in Gulf County, if this is adopted, will be required to place a summary that's approved by the county administration and the TDC on an annual basis on inside each vacation rental home summarizing what our Leave No Trace and trying to provide our visitors a guideline of what is permitted and what is not going forward. Um, I highlighted in the actual revision I just handed to you all comments that I received from you as well as your planning board yesterday um, and Commissioner Yeager starting on page 5 that correction with regards to C30E has been included from your last meeting. On page 7 um, it is simply uh, referring to the exceptions for beachfront and waterfront owners. Um, we had comment at the last meeting and at the planning board meeting with regards to what are the property rights of your Gulf front or beachfront owners. And what we've tried to do in this ordinance is create an exception where obviously they can come to the county on an annual basis, secure a permit, receive the proper tag, put it on their own personal property, and the argument or the discussion was that is their front yard. And under property rights, that is can be argued. Um, obviously our sandy shores of Gulf County are enjoyed by all of our visitors and all of our residents, but we also want to be have a balance and respect the property owner's rights to own along our waterways. So what we've done is we've simply asked that there be a permitting process for our property owners in Gulf County. There's no fee. We simply ask them to identify the property they own each year, um, identify that they own the property and provide that proof, and they'll be provided the proper tags, and then they can leave their property on their beachfront. Um, beyond that, there's a permitting, and you'll see on page 8, um, we've added some additional language for that to provide that tags by the administrative or the administrator shall be provided for uh, applications for dis disabled access, lawful activities, government or educational activities, scientific research, um, or property owners that live, and those shall be no fee for those. The administration shall charge a fee for special events or commercial events that are approved for these beaches. If it is a business venture, then the county will charge a nominal fee for that tag. And you'll see that on page 8. Um, page 9 is the only other changes to the ordinance from your discussions. First and foremost, there was uh, additional comment added with regards to open fires. Bonfires has been replaced with open fires in Gulf County. And you'll see that the language, and I'll read it for the public, um, it says open fires shall be controlled and supervised and intent attended for their entire duration. All open fires on Gulf County beaches shall strictly prohibit materials to burn other than natural wood materials. Pallets, wood with screws, nails, or metals, and all pressure-treated woods are all strictly prohibited from burning on Gulf County beaches. Uh, the Gulf County administration and board reserve the right to prohibit open fires on Gulf County beaches for designated days due to unfavorable weather conditions and public safety concerns. Um, and we also added the word boardwalks to structures for restrictions of prohibited fires within a home or a boardwalk for that matter. Um, if you move down, you'll see section 10. There was discussion with regards to fishing and chumming. Um, I've had discussions with FWC Council um, since then and going back and forth. Um, and we have have a public policy or a public safety concern about protecting our visitors, um, creating a safe environment but also obviously not overstepping the county's restrictions or ability to regulate marine fishing or marine life. That's an FWC uh, jurisdiction. Um, based on the discussions, I would recommend that we strike Section 10 in its entirety, um, and that would be the final change to the current ordinance. I'd be happy to answer any questions uh, before we open it to public comment. Thank you. Any 
Any board member have any questions for the attorney concerning the leave no trace ordinance? All right, this time I'm opening it to the public. Public comment is on the leave no trace ordinance. Lady. <coughs> Good evening. Good evening. Pat Hardman, Coastal Community Association of South Gulf County President. I want to commend uh, Jeremy for the comprehensive writing of this, also for the TDC's input and how much effort they did in researching other areas and trying to come up with a balance plan, something that would protect our citizens throughout Gulf County as well as protecting us on the beaches and coast itself. We've come to you a number of times begging you for some relief. It's, it's gotten beyond the pale, and it's volume. It's, it's whenever I moved here 25 years ago, I could do things out on that beach I can't do today. I wouldn't go skinny dipping today. Even if I... <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. That's we need. It would be painful for the people watching. Um, <laughs> But you've got to, go, you've got to realize that we've, we've got change occurring, and, and we're getting different types of visitors. We're not getting people that were as concerned about the environment and the beach as we were before. And you start throwing 20,000 people out there, it's, it's more than the entire county coming on to all of our beaches. Um, you, we need some relief. All of these are comprehensive now because we didn't address them when they came up one at a time. It's a good ordinance. It's a great start. I do think that your camping ought to be limited to Gulf County residents as well, because one, you were saying they can't, other people can't drive out there. How are they going to get out there? And primitive camping in a front yard in a public beach is not appropriate, no matter where you are. And that's what we have out there. We do not have facilities for them to go to. So I think it ought to be held for Gulf County residents and permitted, just like the driving is. And I want to hold open that driving for our Gulf County residents and from the safety standpoint. And that's, you know, and, and, but historically, but they're the taxpayers too. Outside people are not taxpayers. We do not have to provide them with driving on our beach whenever they don't know how to do it. Um, basically, the rest of it, I think, is just good common sense and protection for we people who live here full time pay taxes, and need some help and relief from uh, from the visitors that come in. And the TDC has done a damn good job bringing them in here. They have. Please vote this up for us. Thank you, Dr. Hart. Anyone else on the leave? No trace. Hold on. Anyone else? All right, we'll get you next. Come on, come on, come on, sir. Go ahead and get her. Terry Lind, St. Joe Beach. Uh, just a couple of questions. Um, what benefit is, as a taxpayer am I going to receive out of this? And how much is the cost of this law going to be? You're going to have to hire people. Where's that money going to come from? And what are you going to cut to make that happen? Can I, uh, I'll, I'll address one of those. We actually do a, a beach driving fee uh, that goes to mostly the sheriff. And, and so we will have some funds to, to now I'm not going to say it's going to be perfect. It's just like setting up a speed limit sign at 35 miles an hour. It's not going to be perfect. There's going to be people that do 45 that you're not going to catch. Right. But I think it's a start, and uh, the enforcement is going to be key to any ordinance that you put in. And we'll do the best we can at, at, at moving that forward. But but one of the, one of the revenue sources is actual fee for the beach driving. Okay. And uh, you were saying that uh, the fires we're going to have beach fires, and then we're going to decide what days you can have beach fires. How's the public going to know about that? No, I, I think the beach fires are open. And I'll, I'll defer to the attorney. But the way I understand it, the beach fires are open. However, 
if for some reason the state says we should have a no burn time or something because of dry conditions or that type thing, that gives the administration the ability to say no more fires on the beach for a certain length of time. So it's a safety measure that gives the administration that ability. That's the way I understand it. But how does the public find out about that? Go ahead. Mr. Linder, if I can address both questions. I think they're very good. And from the public hearings we've sat through the last two years, specifically with regards to the fires, and it goes to enforcement, and we've had it at the other public hearings, the issue of enforcement keeps coming up on this ordinance as well as others. And the public comment, and I think Dr. Harmon touched on it a bit earlier, which is your 80 or 90 percent, once this is placed on the books, you'll have law-abiding citizens that understand what your regulations are. And then the other 10 percent, obviously, the county is going to have to enforce. So the public education efforts by the TDC and the county commission, there's going to be a cooperation with our vacation home rental businesses. It's a community effort to try to educate visitors to this community. With regards to the fires specifically, just to give the county the ability to relay the information and enforce it, if our forestry department or we find out from the state it is not favorable conditions, it is very difficult for communication, especially when we have local states of emergency. The commission will call an emergency meeting. They'll meet within 24 hours. They'll declare it. And oftentimes it's difficult to get the information out to the community. The fact that it's done and they've done it through the statute, they then have the authorization, the ability to take certain actions. If the community doesn't know and there is a fire on the beaches, the county then has the ability for officials to go out and tell them to put it out. And this is simply just an ability for them to do it. It is an additional provision that if it need be during a storm event or a dry season, the county can enforce it. Right now there's no provisions that restrict the county from stopping someone from burning. And how much does that permit for an individual if they want to? You said there was going to be a fee for a permit for an individual? Yes, sir. There's seven provisions where permits will be issued to people in Gulf County. There's five of them that there's no fee. Disabled applications, church events, educational events, government events, scientific research. There's two of those provisions which are commercial events or I forget the other one. Like a wedding or something? There's commercial events, I'm sorry, and then commercial operations, which is we have people that rent umbrellas and tents and chairs in this community that have businesses. They'll also go through the process with the county. The administration on an annual basis, and it's defined in the ordinance, gives the county administration the ability to set a nominal fee to cover the cost of the tags. And then these commercial operations will get those tags. It will identify the umbrellas as theirs so they're not defined as abandoned and we'll know whose they are. And then for weddings and other commercial events, they'll have to come and identify who they are, say that they have permission to be on that beachfront of that property owner, and then get a tag for the day or two days that they're going to have the wedding and pay that nominal fee so that the county officials also know that it's a proper place to have it. By nominal fee, what do you decide is a nominal fee? Yeah, it defines it and it's an annual basis, but it's up to the administration as to what that may be on an annual basis. Okay. But the word nominal is intentional so that it wouldn't be more than what it costs the operation, the application, the tag. When my grandson comes down to visit me and he falls asleep after dark, gazing at the stars on a blanket, what's going to happen to him? As long as he's not within 400 feet of, I'm sorry, 400 feet of a structure, he's technically not camping, so there's nothing. He'd enjoy himself. 400 feet? You're saying 400 feet away from a structure? That's the camping provision. That's correct. But it says right here in your thing that if you've got a blanket or a beach roll, you're actually technically in violation of the law. If you're not with it at night, then it's abandoned. That's correct. It's abandoned, but if you're laying on it, looking up at the stars, and you fall asleep. It's not abandoned. You're with it. You're on it. You're on it. Right. I'm on it, but it says no camping with the intent to sleep. I mean, if you're sleeping on the beach within 100 feet. I'd say they're valid points. I just know there's going to be a process the county goes through in the next couple of years to grow into the ordinance, and so these issues will obviously be addressed by county officials as they move forward. And definition of holes. What's a hole? You going to arrest all the sand crabs out there? I don't know. I mean, there's no definition for a hole. Mr. Lynn, the issue with the holes is that we have folks that dig very large holes, and we have had people that are injured by walking in those holes, and there is an element of common sense that goes into the drafting of any ordinance or law. And if you have a cup 
and you set it in the sand and it makes a hole and you pick up the cup and you leave, nobody's going to come and get you because there's a hole like this. There's dents in the sand. But we clearly have an issue with people digging very large holes that are dangerous, and those need to be filled in. I can agree with that wholeheartedly, but there is no definition of a hole. Mr. Chairman? Mr. Chairman, may I? I'm sorry. The commissioner here wants to. I was just going to say there's three intents behind the ordinance, and I just offer it for the public and the commissioners. It's to protect the property rights. It's to make the tourists and the residents of Gulf County all have an enjoyable environment. And the third is to protect the natural habitat for the beaches and our wildlife. So as long as there's no abuse, then the intent of the ordinance is to protect those three interests. So, you know, disruption or use of these beaches is not intended to restrict people's use. It's intended to protect those three interests, and that was the main goal all along. So minor infractions in terms of that won't be addressed by the ordinance. Yeah, Mr. Chairman, I think we need to back up and really look at this and be very careful with this before we make a decision. Now, I'm in support of it, you know, but but I want to be very cautious. I, I'm wondering, and I'm just asking the board, maybe, just maybe, because it seems like the, most of the problem is on the Cape 15,000, 20,000 tours. Maybe we should start there and leave St. Joe Beach out of it at this point in time and Indian Path. I'm just throwing that out there. I don't. I don't know if that's the answer. I support it. You know, I support it 100 percent. Either way, the board wants to go. I mean, I do support it. Brief comment. I like what our attorney drafted and like to support our attorney. Make a motion, Ms. Bryant. Any time the government gets involved in drafting ordinance and, and, and rules on their citizens, it, it's a challenge. Uh, we all like limited government and the best that we can do, but we all have to protect every, everybody's rights, and that's what we're trying to do with this ordinance. Uh, I, I actually put this ordinance off, and Pat will tell you, we discussed this ordinance for two or three years before we actually drafted this ordinance, but the last summer open my eyes because I, I, I've been on those beaches all my life and I travel those beaches probably a, a couple times a, a, a week during the summer and, and in the winter some. And I can tell you it's a, it, it was a problem this summer. And this is a good ordinance. It's a good ordinance and, and other counties, our surrounding counties have it. It's not a perfect ordinance. And as with any ordinance, we can uh, address issues that we have with it going forward. But I support this ordinance, and if there's no more public comment or, or board comment, oh, we got public comment. Yeah, yeah, I got to go back out here. Mm. Dolores Lowry, 318 Helmet Street, Beacon Hill. Um, I'm in support of the ordinance, but I just have uh, one question. Um, on the uh, uh, dedicated beaches, there's a path that goes to the beach, and a lot of people put carpet on those paths. And um, I know they put it there to keep the keep the path open, but there's there's a path right in front of where I live, and there's a path uh, two blocks down. And the one that's not carpeted is just as nice as the one that is carpeted. And I wonder if this addresses putting carpet on the beach, because I think that that's a a detriment to the, 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 it's a beautiful path with just the white sand. And the other one's got just car, old carpet, you know, and it really doesn't do anything. And I would like to see that addressed too. And I pick up tons and tons of trash every time I go to the beach. So I, I do support the ordinance. Does it have any provision in there for? I don't know I if the, it, some of those walkovers may or may not be Public walkover. This one is a public walkover. There's this Gulf County sign right at 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 the at the um, trail. And uh, Mr. Attorney, you probably could speak to this, but it, it may not be permissible now to be placing remnants of of carpet. It, it may not be something that needs to be addressed if it's already. Yeah. Uh, In terms of the dunes and the vegetation, it's a completely I don't want to say different animal, but it's a completely different environment than our sandy shores. Our ordinance takes it from the mean high water line to the toe of the dune, and now we're dealing specifically with that area. 
Um, this doesn't touch anything with regards to the dunes or prior to that in terms of right-of-ways or private property. Um, uh, St. Joe Beach last year we dealt with Yon's addition and signage and personal deeded restrictions. Uh, this ordinance does not speak to anything with regards to those dune access points. Um, the state has regulation and jurisdiction over them. Um, there are state statutes that specifically speak to that, but this ordinance only talks from the toe of the dune vegetation line to the mean high water line. Okay. Um, that's a different, it's outside the scope of this ordinance. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Lowry. Mr. Chairman, may I make yes, one come on, comment? Yes, come on. Um, I, I, I just, I want to make the comment that, Mr. McLemore, I was playing with you there, obviously, and you, you threw it out there. I had to hit it. But I agree okay. with you. <laughs> I agree with you. Let's okay. make the motion. Let's move forward. But, but I do, um, I, I do think that as we move, if we um, accept this today as we move forward, we may have to go back and revise it in its application if we have things that don't work. Ready? Ready. Uh, Debbie Schmidt, St. Joe Beach. Uh, first of all, please don't leave St. Joe Beach out of this. Uh, I just threw that out there. I, I, just, I just really <laughs> want to make it very clear. We have some major issues there, uh, and I appreciate how you drafted this. It's absolutely beautifully done. But we do have people who just come and camp right there, and it's not, what, 200 feet from my window? And they will stay for three days. And it is not a pleasant feeling. So I, I, I would urge you to look at all the beaches the same in Gulf County, because we are pretty much the same in Gulf County. Um, we need it to happen. The 100,000 pounds that you picked up does not count the trash that we pick up when we go to the beach and we see trash. That doesn't have to so it is a huge, huge problem and we need this legislation and this piece of regulation is, is beautifully done. And I would say please let's pass it before we have to deal with this problem again. Great. Thanks. Thank you, dear. Anyone else? Anyone else? All right. Let me address. Lissa Delaney, 139 Sand Pine Drive. Lissa Delaney, 139 Sand Pine Drive, Fort St. Joe. Um, yes, the time has come for this legislation. Apparently, we're like the last county in the area that doesn't have one, so we're getting everybody on our beaches that don't care to pick up after themselves. And I've been coming here for 15 years, and last summer was Tent City. It was awful. You knew when Saturday came because that's when the tents were empty because everybody left their stuff on the beach. Um, the only question I have is when you talked about the beach fires and you said supervision, it might be appropriate to have an age on that. So maybe 12 years old, 16 years old, something like that. Thank you. Uh, anyone else? Yeah, I, think, uh, I think everyone knows the feeling it's going to be. Come on. I'm sorry, I'm a little slow. Sure. But, uh, <laughs> See. Oh, on the beach. <laughs> 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 Couldn't resist. My name is Gretchen Mays, 8609 Highway 98, St. Joe Beach. Um, you said something about peace and serenity somewhere in there? Yeah. Okay. Has fireworks ever been addressed with this ordinance? I mean, you talk about fires on the beach and safety. I had an expended firework line on my deck, and during the summer, they blow them off, mostly tourists, from the minute the sun goes down until it comes up. There's no peace and serenity in front of my house. So I don't know if fireworks were addressed. I think there's a state law. There is. Anything that flies or goes boom, it's not that supposed to. Like when we have the 4th of July. Yeah, well, and I, you know, I don't begrudge anybody having a good time on the 4th of July, but really, <laughs> I'm just saying maybe that's something should be looked at as well. Okay, thanks. Uh, uh, one more. I think we all got the feeling in here. Or not. All right, the Leave No Trace is now public comment is closed. All right. The wishes of the board on the Leave No Trace ordinance. I'm, I'm good with it, Mr. Chairman. I'm, I'm, I'll make the motion. I'll, I'll second. Okay. All right. Here I'm we go. Here I'm we go. Good with it. All right. And uh, Mr. Chairman, 
Yes. Commissioner Yeager, if you can include in the motion as amended today that you have in front of you for the purpose of the public. With the changes that was that was sure. presented. We have a motion by Commissioner Yeager. Second by Commissioner Ryan. Any further board discussion on this no trace ordinance? Any further discussion from anyone in the audience on this no trace ordinance? Not if there's no opposition. Motion passes by and over. Today, this will be the final public comment, is the uh, RV ordinance. Sorry. Yes, sir. Thank you, Commissioner. Uh, the third and final public hearing this evening, again, is compliant with Florida Statute 125, Section 66, is this ordinance is required to have two public hearings, one during the day, one after 5 o'clock in the evening, barring a special vote of this commission. Um, so this is the second hearing compliant with the statute. It was advertised on the 5th of January and the 19th in the News Herald um, as recommended by Florida statute. And I'll read it by title unless there's an objection from the commission. An ordinance of Gulf County for uh, Florida for creating policies regulating recreational vehicles, otherwise known as RVs, in their location Placement RVs per parcel, use and storage of RVs within both unincorporated Gulf County and within the coastal corridor to be commonly referred to as the Gulf County RV Ordinance. For said policies to amend, be codified, and become part of the Gulf County Land Development Regulations and providing for the repealer severability modifications that may arise from consideration at public hearing and providing for an effective date. Uh, commissioners, you each have a copy of the advertised and distributed uh, RV Ordinance. Um, again, our first public hearing had offered some initial comments. Uh, this ordinance, similar to your Leave No Trace, is the result. Um, the Leave No Trace was several years. The RV has been back and forth before the Commission and your staff for the past few years as well. Um, what you have in front of you is the most recent version of the recommended uh, recreational vehicle language. Um, what it does, in essence, is it creates a coastal corridor construct, a coastal construction corridor. Um, in the last meeting we were here, we provided you with a color map and the one that's been published and provided to the public has those lines delineated by our GPS uh, department, our GIS department. The three lines that were offered for your consideration, which was one, the intercoastal, the second was 1,500 feet from the mean high water line, and the third was one mile from the mean high water line. They were offered to you all as different vari uh, various options of defining what your coastal construction corridor. You heard Mr. Knight come in and provide you some um, background on the Florida Building Code and our requirements along the coast for building requirements of single-family stick-built dwellings. The first question, and you'll see there's options in your ordinance as to ask you all to define what that corridor would be, one of those three. Beyond that, there is two different zones. If you're landward of that line that you define, then the current land development regulations for RVs applies to everyone in the county. That's already part of your law, and it exists, and it will continue to be uh, utilized by the county staff. If you're seaward of the line that you define, then there is considered a corridor of uh, higher concern or public safety. Those are the areas more vulnerable to wind and flooding events. Um, we've provided the whereas clauses in this ordinance to provide the public policy of why you would adopt this ordinance. And what the restrictions do is it applies um, certain regulations to folks that want to bring a recreational vehicle and have it within this coastal construction corridor. Um, I know in the last two weeks since our public hearing, I believe you commissioners have probably received in excess of 50, maybe 60 uh, emails. Um, and it runs the spectrum for, against, everywhere in between. Um, I've done my part and tried to read as many of those as I can. I believe you all have two in your comments to me individually. Um, but I'd be happy to uh, answer any questions. I've also made some notes from your last meeting. 
Also, your planning board has had, I believe, we counted seven public hearings on recreational vehicles going back for the past few years. This commission's had several public hearings prior to January 13th on this issue. Um, so I'll be happy to answer any questions and before you open it to the public comment. All right. Board have any questions? Yes, I do. All right. Hey, Mr. Uh, okay, maybe, Mr. Chairman, I can lighten the load a little, little bit now, and I'm going to throw this out there. We'll see how the board reacts and how the public reacts to it. It seems like to me that the, the big issue is St. Joe Beach, the Cape, Indian Pass. Island View, Oak Grove, Simmons Bow, they don't seem to be a big issue there. They're protected a lot from the storm by the peninsula. So maybe I would support leaving those three sections out of the ordinance. So, so maybe that'll lighten the load a, a little bit. And I don't know how the board feels about that. You know, if the board feels good about it, the public feels good about it, we'd move forward with that. I'd put it on the table. You repeat the three? Yes. Okay. That all comes Island View. Yeah, thank you. Uh, Island View, Oak Grove, Simmons Bow, because they're protect, protected somewhat, you know, somewhat from the peninsula. St. Joe Beach is wide open, the Indian Pass is wide open, the Cape's wide open. You know, and and here again, this is an issue that we can we can look at if we need to see where we need to come back at a later date and look at these areas and perhaps the whole county. We can do that, but for right now, you know, that would give us some starters. Yes, sir. You know, I mean, that was discussed at the last public hearing, and, I, and I've got some thoughts that that, that make that making work. Uh, but those folks in that area will still have to abide by the LDRs that says one per lot. They Absolutely. And the ones that, in the way I understand it, the, with the ordinance, the ones that already have all these there, they're grandfathered in pretty much. This is for new residents that can't bring them in and leave them for a long period of time or whatever and have to be removed by storm. I'm, I'm anxious to hear what everybody has to say. All right. The, uh, any, you have any on this or Mr. Why go to the? On just this particular issue okay. of the three or the whole RV ordinance? I don't see how we can make a decision on the three until we know what the ordinance is, whether it applies to those three. I, I, I understand what you're saying, but I think we should not vote on those three areas until we have more discussion regarding what this particular ordinance says. Um, I, sure. Yeah, if I, if I can. Hold it a minute. Yes, sir. I got the floor. Identify, for everyone in the TV here, identify the ones that you want to eat. Yeah, yeah. everyone now. Let's go. And on. I and I agree with Commissioner Brown. Let's let's hear a discussion sure. on it before we actually right. take well, a vote. Right, but what I'm looking at is Highland View, Highland View, all right, Oak Grove, and Simmons Bay. Grove. And and like I said, I, I want to hear a discussion from the public. You Simmons. know, okay. This is something that I just put out there that, that we can think about and. and that's the Jones Homestead you're talking about right now, or is that yeah, the that, Oak Grove? Yeah, all the way down to Simmons Bow, you know, exclude all that. Okay. Into that, because that's not what the major issue is. If, all right, I just let, we, let him get through now. I'll come back to that. Boy. If we leave, if we if we do Cape Sandblast, Indian Pass, St. Joe Beach, that's where our tax base is in the county anyway. So I don't, I don't think we'd be hurting the county much. You know, by not including those three. All right, now let's go over here. And Mr. Chairman, I think that we can work through some of the issues with the ordinance as it's drafted prior to going to public comment because we may be able to resolve some of the issues that various folks have that are here in attendance. And I, I think that um, our attorney has some input that he would like to add from discussions. Mr. Attorney, you sure. uh, I guess I would ask the commission um, in an effort to try to narrow the scope. Uh, there's folks out here that are affected by all three interpretations, first and foremost, of the corridor. So if I could ask the commission um, 
if you want to provide us some direction as to which line delineates your corridor, we can entertain more public comment. But if you say that the intercoastal is not applicable or it's too far landward, you may knock out some of the concerns of property owners and RV owners in the county. So if some of these don't apply, I know we've had discussions with some of you commissioners one-on-one uh, -on -one in the last few weeks where you said 1,500 feet falls in the middle of a road. And you'll have property owners looking across the street of who has the restriction and on the other side of the street who doesn't. Mm -hmm. um, the intercoastal obviously is way landward of one mile. Um, so if there's direction or comment from the commission that you can provide to staff or even if you wanted to take a eliminate some of these lines, it may eliminate some of the discussion uh, and then we can narrow the scope to certain sections from there. I would uh, like to make the motion that we eliminate the intercoastal as second. the line. Second. That's a good motion. Second by Commissioner Yeager. Any further board discussion on anyone from the audience on this? What? Opposition? Eliminate the intercoastal canal. Opposition motion passed 5 and 0. So that took care of that one. The second, the second discussion, thank you, Commissioners, is the issue with regards to wind and flood events and the Florida Building Code. To narrow the scope further is the 1,500 feet is defined for cate certain categories of what we build here in, Gulf in Florida. And then the one mile, as I indicated, the 1,500 feet from the mean high water line falls on some roads throughout our coastal communities, whereas one mile, the majority of that delineation falls in Panther Valley, St. Joe property, um, and it's it's a cl more clear or defined line of demarcation um, where you don't have neighborhoods separated by a certain line. It's also much more difficult to interpret and enforce, obviously, as we move forward and you subdivide your properties throughout the undeveloped portions of the coastal uh, Gulf County. So based on that and the comments that you all received, it would be, a uh, from the public policy perspective, it would be much more enforceable and easily easier to interpret if there was a clear line that was less impact to our community. That makes right. perfect sense to me. You don't want to split neighborhoods, so I, I would suggest that we do away with 1,500 feet, go with the one mile. I'll make okay. that for me. I've got a motion here for the one mile. See the buffer zone. Second that motion. Thank you, sir. Second by Commissioner Quinn. Any further board discussion on this one mile? One mile now. Yes, sir. Now, I, I thank you for that for that yeah. clarification. Nothing's been voted on in terms of the ordinance. So I don't want the public to think that you've passed anything other than what you're doing is you're narrowing the scope of where you think this is going to impact. Nothing's been voted on on the ordinance. What you've done is you've elected to take one of those three options. And if you do pass the ordinance now, it will be landward and seaward of one mile unless Commissioner McLemore's discussion goes further to eliminate, eliminate certain sections. Okay. okay. Well understood. And this don't affect the ordinance. As far, but it, no. With a way to the line. the boundary line, so I'm going to put a motion on the table right now. Well, we got we got got a motion. Oh, you had not yet call for the vote? Okay, uh, go ahead. For discussion on this one mile. I'm sorry. Anyone in the audience, any problem? Everything from a mile in when you get a five to one for partial. So mm. now we've narrowed it down. We're going to work from a mile to the coast. Where are we at now? All right. Any Anyone from the audience on that? No opposition? Uh, the motion passed 5 and 0 oh, that we narrow it, place the corridor at uh, one, or the buffer at one mile inland. Okay. Right now you can go. Let's try to narrow it on down. I'm going to make a motion that we that we cut out Highland View, Oak Grove, and Simmons Bayway from the ordinance. Yes. 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 Uh, you, whoa, 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 now, wait a minute. <laughs> There's some seconds out there. <laughs> let, let me let me second for discussion. But I I really think from this point we've drawn the line. Let's hear from the public before we carry a motion like this. If y'all don't mind. Right. Well, we have a motion. We have a second. Now we're in discussion. Let's hear from. Them. We can vote either direction. Um, Mr. Chairman, yeah. I I believe um and Mr. Novak, I believe that. We've had prior discussions regarding with uh, PDRB, and I, I think that some of the issues in this ordinance that we still can scale down. Um, I think <coughs> I think if we just before we open to the public, and I I want to hear from the public, but if, if we can scale this ordinance, you know, define things a little bit better prior to hearing from um, the audience, I, I think that we may limit. That's right, and. 
and I understand that we may limit some areas. I think that in Commissioner Yeager's area, it, it might be a little bit more difficult to define. Highland View is very well defined, so that's easy to understand. But I, I think that one of the biggest issues when we, if and when we pass this ordinance, that we have a, a, a term, continual use and occupancy. And I, I think that that is very confusing. I, I think what we need to do is define how someone loses their grandfather um, clause. And Mr. Mr. Attorney, I, I think you had some suggestions on how we may be able to revise that and make it more clear. Uh, yeah, Commissioners, I guess one of the issues is over the last five years we've gone from uh, 14 days <laughs> to seven days to 72 hours to 48 hours. So it's run the whole spectrum of when it is unoccupied and not in use, a recreational vehicle. And I'd say it was the other end of the spectrum a few years ago, and today we're here discussing that if it's left unattended and occupied during hurricane season, as defined by NOAA, that it's in violation of the ordinance as it's written. Um, the comments that you've all heard is folks come down, leave it, and then go back home during hurricane season. Um, and that's the better part of five, I believe, five, six months a year. Um, so they have to take it with them if they're going to leave it for more than two days. So, you know, hearing all the comments and knowing your past discussions and public hearings, mm -hmm. is there a directive of the board as to what you define? I understand Commissioner Bryan saying that the use and occupancy and it being unoccupied, there's the issue of enforcement. And we have one code enforcement official. And it, how do we determine when it's been unoccupied and not attended to? Um, then during the hurricane season, that's six months, they'll be out regulating that within a mile of the coast. So I guess it would be a question back to the commission as to what is the commission's directive or direction as to what is defined. The, 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 the purpose of the ordinance as is written in the whereas clauses from your, all your meetings has been public safety. And it's a recreational vehicle, not a single family dwelling. If it's left unattended during a storm event, then that's where the public safety comes. And I believe the comments you received at your last meeting two weeks ago is if they leave it for a month and there's no storm events, then it was never a public safety issue. <coughs> okay. But they still have an obligation to the community and to their neighboring property owners that if there is inclement weather or there is a local state of emergency, that they have an obligation to remove it. And so four years ago, we had an evacuation provision. It was two pages long, and it said what they had to do. And you received public comment. It said you don't want people coming here during a storm event to move it out. Mm -hmm. So the commission has to find and will provide the staff some direction. <clears throat> You've done it where you have to come and get it out. And today, it's you can't leave it here when you leave. And if there's a middle ground there, we certainly receive your directive on that. But we've, tried, we, we've introduced it to you both ways. And if there's a middle between that, I'd ask you all for that directive. Mr. Chairman, yes. What what I would suggest, first of all, I would like to say that I I believe that we have to stop new RVs from coming into these areas, and so I think we need this ordinance. However, we have people who are here, and we need to be very fair to the folks that are here with their RVs. So, to me, what in in my belief, what the issue is is what is fair for the folks that have their RVs on their lots and when do they lose that right to have that RV? I, I believe that we should keep the provision that if the title is conveyed, if the title is changed, I like the way the attorney has uh, worded it, that they lose their grandfather clause. Or if the owner passes away, which would of course also result in a transfer of title. Um, but I don't want to see us punish our RV owners that if they leave for a certain amount of time, they can't come back. Or um, if, I don't believe this is in here, but they are allowed to replace the RV and put a new RV. And they certainly need to be able to take it and get it worked on. So I would like to see that um, continuous use and occupancy be defined as a, a fairly long period of time where it would actually be that they abandoned using that lot for an RV. They don't get to come back six months later and decide they want to put an RV there. 
I think that that's what we need to strive tonight is to, to come up with that fair um, provision that ends it. But I do believe that we need to move forward with the, with the ordinance. Okay. I approach. Yes. <coughs> Commissioners, what I try to do is um, summarize some of the statements and the comments you've all received. And in my discussions with you each individually uh, since your first public hearing, there was really um, the directive and the comments I received from you, I'll try to summarize them. Uh, first and foremost, you'll see number one at the top of this summary sheet of my questions, and you just clarified that for me, which is I asked you to all provide the community and the staff some 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 more clarity as to what is the impact area of this corridor. And you all elected number two, which is a mile from the mean high water line. Section two on that page in front of you, and I believe that this eight or nine page ordinance, there's one section, which is section 6B, which defines what is the coastal construction corridor and what is the restrictions in that corridor. We have gone, as I indicated, across the whole spectrum of what is use and occupancy, how long, evacuation routes. And what I try to do is maybe kind of clarify or summarize what you all and the community have provided to try to find some of that middle ground. And I'm going to read it if I can. Um, it, uh, RV regulations specifically within the defined coastal construction corridor. This is new language that I'm offering to you commissioners for your consideration. It's RVs permitted within the defined coastal construction corridors shall be bound to all the regulations stated above and comply with the following additional restrictions. And it will go as follows. Re one, recorded property owners of parcels or lots within the coastal construction corridor prior to January 27, 2015, shall be grandfathered to continue their use of property for personal recreation vehicles with the following conditions met. There's three conditions. The first is that on an annual basis, each person that owns that property and that RV go to the county fill a one-page application and receive the annual permit from Gulf County to place on it, identifying who they are, that they own it, um, and that they have permission to put that RV within the zone. B is that they continue to meet all the requirements under six, Section 6A, and six, 6A is basically a restatement of our LDRs. And I have section Article 3 of your LDRs, which we've talked about extensively, which is you have your setback requirements, your parking spaces, everything that's on the books today for, L for our RVs would apply to these RVs within the corridor. The third is that during a mandatory evacuation, all RVs within 40 hours of Gulf County's declaration for wind, storm, or flood events within the corridor would be removed. It goes further to say that there's only three ways in which a grandfather provision in Gulf County would be lost or removed from those parcels that were owned and recorded in the clerk's office prior to January 27th. First and foremost, if you sell or transfer the property from its current titled ownership, you lose your grandfather. Second, the owner uh, passes. That would extend, extinguish the grandfather. The third is, as I stated before, that an owner's failure to comply with the mandatory removal of the RV from the corridor within the 48 hours of declaration of a local state of emergency by Gulf County due to a wind, storm, or flood threat the owner shall complete the calendar year under which they receive the annual RV permit and thereafter prohibited under current ordinance regulations. Meaning, in essence, they will they were grandfathered in for that calendar year. They, if they are no, if they are cited for violating the mandatory evacuation for that recreational vehicle, and not a six-month evacuation, but the state of emergency, and when that emergency passes, they can return. Um, they will continue to receive that grandfather provision in perpetuity until one of the other two events happen, which is a sale or a death. Further, recreational permits for the corridor use for anyone that purchases a parcel of property in Gulf County within a mile of the mean high water line following today. Gulf County shall issue up to two recreational 14-day permits to a parcel or lot owner within the coastal construction corridor on an annual basis following the proper application and receipt of permit to be prominently displayed on the RV during its occupancy within the corridor. This provision shall not apply to those RVs lawfully visiting Gulf County's RV commercial parks within the coastal construction corridor. Those will always be available. They're, they're regulated by the state. They have private commercial enterprise that regulate the RVs that come and go, and they'll always be uh, regulated by the state and that business owner. 
This would apply to anybody that purchases a piece of property and the county wants to bring an RV down in the future. They can come to the county and still use it for recreational purposes as long as they identify it, get the tag, and they can come and put it anywhere within the corridor. So th this is a reflection of the comments that you all offered, the planning board comments as well as the public comment um, to hopefully, like I said, we've tried uh, the other approach, we've tried what you have in front of you currently, and this is a third variation, if you will, for your consideration. I have some. Okay. On these revisions, Mr. Novak, regarding the mandatory evacuation of all the RVs within 48 hours of the declaration of state of emergency, does that apply as it's written, does it apply also to unoccupied RVs? If I have an RV that I store at my home, do I have to um, get that out of here as well? Or is it only the occupied RV? As it, as, and again, that's for you all to provide further <laughs> clarification. But as I read it right now, an RV, whether it's occupied or unoccupied, the intent is during those events that they're removed from the corridor for flooding and wind purposes for public safety. So if it's sitting next to a home, it also needs to be removed from next to the home outside that mile zone. And, and obviously there's probably some way of securing an RV if I have a large, something I can drive it into and it's secure, I don't have to evacuate it. Could there be a provision for um, people who have something on their lot that can secure their RV that they would not have to remove it within the 48 hours? I'm concerned that I understand the safety issues here. I'm, I'm concerned that if, if we have this provision, we do have a lot of RVs here, and they have to get it out within 48 hours. And as we know, sometimes the hurricanes, they keep turning, and we don't know for sure if they're going to be here. And then all of a sudden, we have a state of emergency, and we have a lot of folks trying to get into the county to get these out. And we may not be able to let them in and then we have prevented them from removing it. So I, I'm a little concerned with the practical application of this provision, although I do understand the safety issues. Um, my other question is, can we add something to the second portion where the grandfather provision ends upon the sale or transfer of ownership from the current title owner that would prevent the title from being held in a corporation or an LLC or a trust that would never transfer, although the people within that corporation, LLC and trust may change. That would be a way to get around that provision. So I, I'd like to see if we could put some language in that would prevent someone from using one of those entities to avoid losing their grandfather provision. Yeah. 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 on the board before I go to the public. Yeah. Well, I, I think Commissioner uh, Bryan brought up a question, of, and, and somehow we would like to address that. Do you have any language that you, that maybe regarding the forty-eight hours? Yes. Um, if we didn't have this requirement, are we in in violation of anything else that affects our county, our our ratings? Uh, Anything having to do with safety? Um, is, this, is this required under anything, any other body of law, or um, does this provide us any kind of savings to, to have this requirement? I don't, I don't have anything, Commissioner, that I can cite to specifically. But this is in here strictly from a safety perspective. And Mr. Richardson, sometimes I believe uh, this may apply to a VE zone if you're in it. Okay. And beyond that, maybe a regulated floodway. Beyond that, I'm not sure past that, Commissioner. Okay. And I'm not saying we can't have it. I just think that there's some concerns if we don't let the folks in. If we've, I've been in places where we're evacuating and all the lanes go out and people can't get in. Um, so I just think we need to be careful with that. But I, I like how we have narrowed this down, and it's. It, I think this is a, a more fair treatment of our current RV owners. Okay. Oh, now we got a motion on the floor, haven't we? And a second. 
You're going to have to remind me what the motion was. Yeah. I can do that very easily. I remember now. You just think for discussion. You can narrow it right on down now if y'all. Well, I mean, we need to go out here and listen. I hope so. What do you want to do? You want to hold the motion? Yeah. Well, let me back my second off until we hear more of the public discussion. And let's go from there. All right. At this time, it's open. To the public on the RV ordinance, and this will be the second and final, and the first gentleman that we're going to address will be Mr. Doug Smith. Doug, are you here? Yes. Yes, indeed. Yeah, come on up. There you go. He submitted a request. I think this may just be a foolish waste of my time and y'all's, folks. I'm Doug Smith, 9317 Old Avenue, Beacon Hill. Beacon Hill, okay. Yeah, I know. I don't know why it's gone to such lengths. You know, it's like we don't trust our beers at all. They're insane, low life, nobodies. They don't know their own, their own business, okay? The fact is, is that I'm a full time beer, so I'm, I'm the exception to the rule in most cases. I'm going to be gone for six months. I'm going to be gone for nine months. I may be gone a year. You know, it depends on where I want to be, when I want to be. And you come in here, and, 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 you know, I do believe Cape Sandblast is a potential problem. Okay? I do believe that. You're talking about the evacuation. If you have all these people coming out at one time, so I don't believe Cape Sandblast should allow any more RVs. You already have the state park there. If you have those, the evacuation and emergency vehicles need to get in, potential problems with the RVs breaking down, I, you could end up, you know. So I do believe that makes it unique. Okay? Okay. Uh, I do believe we should go with the uh, NOAA, the National, you know, National Weather Service. When they declare a hurricane warning, we need to evacuate. You know, so I'm going to be gone before that. Uh, the storms may, you know, come and go or whatever. But when they declare that warning, we need to evacuate. Uh, I do believe that those people that don't move them should be fined. You know, I, I, do, I, do, I do believe there needs to be a fine, a penalty, if they don't move them. Okay? Uh, and that the other people, if you know this is the, the circumstances of the hurricane warning, they can make plans with hauling companies to haul them off. You know? I, and I don't know why y'all seem to hate RV so much. Uh, because I, I, I do believe that Beacon Hill, St. Joe's Beach, and Highland View will produce more taxes and add jobs for contractors and so, subcontractors if you continue to allow the RVs to be placed on these residential lots. Uh, in addition, you know, the local economy, the restaurants, hardware stores, mechanics, hospitals, doctors, dentists, pharmacies, etc., you know, will make a contribution uh, to these facilities if you allow the RVers to come. Yeah, you know, because you have what you have today is you have 10,000 baby boomers turning 62 every day. There are going to be more and more people that choose this lifestyle to travel like I do and don't want to be here all the time. You know, I mean, I headed out the last time we had cold weather further south. I don't like cold weather, uh, and I just I just don't know why you think the RVers are so bad. You know, you can eliminate them from sandblast because they they are a potential problem. But these other beaches, we're going to be out of here, and if they don't, there's a fine to them. You know, that, that you know, uh, denotes the fact that there is, okay, time. yeah, that's my time, I know, I know. <laughs> but, you know, I, I really feel like it's probably a waste of time uh, on my part, but I just don't know why the RVs are condemned so bad. I just don't, I'm sorry. Linda Sergage, 9025 Olive, Beacon Hill. And I like what you've said about the grandfathering clause. If you accept that, I'm happy. <laughs> so, thank you. Thank you, dear. All right, that takes care of the seat. Now we'll just go out to the general public, get the hands up, and we'll go. Uh, where we want to start. We'll start back. Young lady, yes. Come on.
Sharon Winchester, Lightkeepers Drive, Beacon Hill, St. Joe Beach. I'd like to address the exempting of any place uh, between here and St. Joe Beach. We have both an RV and a home. We park our RV on our lot. We're not allowed to live in it or have anybody to occupy it, but we certainly will get in it and get out of here when we need to. I've worked in the mobile home uh, construction industry for uh, quite a while. I've lived everywhere from Key West to the Panhandle now. And I have seen a lot of devastation with mobile homes particularly, tied down or not tied down. Highland View is a place waiting to be hit. And yes, there's a peninsula, but when you suffer some bad hurricane that spawns tornadoes, then you need to get places, you need to get these um, homes out of there, these temporary trailers, fifth wheels, uh, or uh, campers. They're there, out of here, and if they don't live there, something's going to happen. I would hate to be a homeowner and have one of those come through my roof. And it would be a shame if the board has an opportunity to include them in this provision, and they don't, and something happens to somebody in a site-built home. So I'm speaking from a safety point. No, no, sir, I'm just saying Highland View between here and St. Joe Beach. They're, very, they're right there at the water. And yes, there's a barrier island, but you haven't had a bad hurricane in a long time. And they're just sitting ducks, I think. Oh, uh, about a category three or four or five, I think, I think and we won't, uh, we'll all be in trouble. Right. Thank you. 20 miles in. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, we'll come over here. Uh, let me, uh, yes, sir, young man, come on. Hey, uh, Donald Anderson, 318 Panada. Um, I've got a question. So mostly this is a kind of a safety issue with RVs. Is that, okay. is that what I... That's the biggest part of it. Okay, the big, biggest part of it. Um, we, we bought that lot, I think, seven, seven years ago. And, you know, we paid you know, a pretty good price for it. Um, we, we, you know, I built the structure on it according to the building department. You know, I, talk, I, I could do up the design or the plan for it, um, just a simple pole barn. But uh, w one of the issues is, you know, if, if you, uh, on, on my shelter, if, if, if we have a hurricane come here, I'm not going to be concerned with my RV. You know, the first thing that's going to go is all these, these pole, you know, basically these pole barns, like I, I got on my, my RV and a lot of others got on there. They're not really built, so what do you, Get hit from a propane tank from an RV or a piece of sheet metal off the off the roof. I mean, either way, that, that, they're more of a safety issue than the RVs themselves. I mean, like on on, on my shelter, and I, I built in tens of millions worth of, of, of buildings, you know, in the last couple of years. The wind load on that building in Decatur County, I don't know what it is here, is about eight thousand pounds per. Per, per post. So basically, that's what kind of uplift you'll have at about 100 mile per hour wind. So basically, if, if we had some of, of hurricane country, my shelter and all these other structures would, would be gone way before the RVs would. Now, of course, I, mean, I got a pretty good size. I've got a 36 foot RV. It's pretty heavy. It, it's not going to really go anywhere unless it's a pretty much pretty strong hurricane right through here. But, I mean, from a safety standpoint, some of these buildings that we got are a lot more of a problem than the RV themselves. You know, I just don't see why, you know, the RVers, I don't, I hope within the next two or three years to, to, to build a house. I don't like, you know, staying in the RV, you know, when I, when I come down here, but I don't want to be penalized or told I can't use RV with the fact that I, I bought that piece of property and I built the structure on it. I did everything right, and it, you know, it cost me quite a bit of money. So don't, I don't want to be told I can't use my RV, or, and I don't really have a problem with being grandfathered in. But, but I would like to, you know, one day, you know, get, you know, give it to, you know, maybe give it to my son. But 
I still hope within a couple of years to have a house built on it. I don't like RVs, and I know we do have a problem. We do need to address that in some way, but hopefully don't just take the ride of these hardworking people to not be able to use an RV. Thank you. Okay. Got anybody over here? If we get this side, we'll reach over here and get a couple, okay? Either one of you two gentlemen. I'm Paul Digby in Holland View, and I really like Mr. McElmore's proposal just to exempt us and let us continue like we're doing. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Paul. John Arnold, Beacon Hill, uh, board. Uh, there's a lot of things I want to say, and I know I ain't going to get it done in three minutes, but uh, I can touch base on a couple of things the last few people said. You know, I went over to Panama one day when they came out with these Class A and Class B and Class C trailers and stuff, and I asked the dealer over there, a big old country boy over there, I said, sir, I said, what's the difference in these classes? He said, boy. There ain't no difference. When a big storm comes, they're all going to blow away. But, you know, one of my biggest points is these people, just like the gentleman that just spoke, he came down here, kind of touched base on what he spoke about on the LDR a while ago. You got people come down here, they buy a piece of property. Okay? They got plans for that piece of property. They invest in that property. They pay the sewer tap. They pay the water tap. Counties, the city's making money off that. The county's getting the land developed, and they spend their hard-earned money to put that RV on there. When they bought that property, it was zoned. It was reg regulations on it, or no regulations on it, whatever it may be. Well, if it didn't have regulations on it, I don't see how you can change the regulations on a piece of property a man's done bought with a plan in mind, and he's using it for what he had it planned for. He may be planning on building on it. Ten years, five years when he retires. But he still likes to use it with his kids to come down here to the beach because that's when he wants to retire and move down here. Uh, so if he bought that property under the understanding, when he paid for it, when he spent his hard-earned money for that property, how can y'all take his rights away? All right? Um, I don't know, somebody, I don't know, I look around... Uh, uh, I like the I, I like parts of your your ordinance, but I really don't like much of it. Um, I like the uh, I like the part about you know hurricane evacuations. I know I have a little RV park, you know, and I, I, man, I, I tell them when they move in there, I got a list of rules and regulations. That's my rules and regulations because I own the land. It's not your rules and regulations because y'all don't own the land. Mama told me when I was a little boy. She told all her customers, I grew up in the real estate business. I was a little kid hanging out with my mama selling real estate right here in Gulf County when they brought me up here. The lady said, well, I want to buy this piece of property over here. What's them people going to do with that property over there? She told them, she said, well, if you want to control that piece of property over there, you better buy it. Because these are the regulations on this property that you're buying. Now, if you want to build your nice big house, you better build your nice house over there in uh, Seashores, go up there, somebody that's got some regulations on them for their house. So then people do their homework, they got a plan to build them a nice house. That's what these subdivisions are for, with regulations. And like I say, I got so much more, I could go on for about a day or something, but um, I would uh, probably not bore you, but I know y'all don't want to spend all day talking to me. Thank you, John. Dr. Hardman, come on. I think you've had your hand up. And then we're going to go back here and here and then that. Good evening, Pat Hardman, uh, President of the Coastal uh, Community Association of South Coast County. Because we kicked this down the road and didn't do anything for four or five years, we're ending up with a crisis situation. We are, we are the county that doesn't have any regulations. If we went over to Walton County, this is not an issue. They can't live on it. They can't put their RV in Walton County or in this wind zone area. If you go over to our Franklin County, you could put it in there for two weeks at a time. 
We tried to come in, y'all, and say, let's be fair. What we'd like is no hard fees. But let's be fair to those people that did buy, that did put them in, and try to make some exceptions and allow some grandfathering. Now, some of the things that you've added to this, allowing new purchases to come in and now have an RV, virtually throws all this out the window. There's no need to have one. You've got it so watered down it doesn't make any difference. I would say don't go there. Go with what we've got in the plan where you say you can do these things. You're here. You're grandfathered. You got it. But at these points, things have to change. I like your idea of, of what you're really talking about, zoning, y'all. I mean, bottom line, you're talking about zoning, best use of property. I disagree with someone's value being included in your exceptions for a couple of different reasons. One, I have an office building in there, <laughs> and my property values don't need to be devalued. Two, it's a, it's a flood-prone area. And when you put an RV there and you don't come get it, you go wipe out my office. And I think that that man said it. When a storm comes, they blow away. We need to have the regulation that they have to move before a storm. Your grandfather let that takes care of folks that have one now. The other thing is you you've got to come back whether you, anybody likes it or not. When you put an RV on a piece of property that is a value difference, a tremendous value difference, a cape piece of property that is high value piece of property, and you put an RV next to it. You devalue the property. Therefore, you're hurting the owner. Therefore, you're hurting the owner. I'm sorry. It's it, asking the appraiser. Okay? If I put the same value, if I put, if I put the same RV on a piece of property, I can raise the value of, of surrounding properties if I, I'm putting the nicest RV in there. So you're, you've got people that live here full time that have stick built houses that are built by the code. Because they're in the wind zone, we pay extra to have to build those houses in that code. They can't be built on the ground. We have to have them elevated. All of a sudden, you're coming in and making exceptions for about 2% of the total population as opposed to helping the 98% of us who have stick built homes. So you're making an exception for something that is a danger in a flood zone. I don't know how to say it any other way. You're going to devalue the property out on these higher ends. You're going to end up with me having a danger. Talked to an insurance person the other day. If the proliferation gets much worse, we can have insurance issues. Not being able to have our stick bill homes insured or pay a higher price because of it. So if you want to talk zoning, talk zoning. But I don't think someone's by you ought to be included. We've got the same problem there of getting people out. We've got one access egress coming out. Y'all did help us keep the place open, but we still got one. And we've got flood, and we've got water, and we've got a tourist corridor going out there. And that property doesn't need to be one mobile home after no one RV after another. But we need some safety. We need some protection. We're asking you for protection. Those of us live here full time, pay taxes, live in stick built, and appreciate our value of our properties being sustained or not devalued. Uh, uh, just let's go here. Our turn. Commissioners, with the public comment, and then, like I said, some folks will come up. I just wanted to address the issue if it's specific to what's happened. And like I said, there's a benefit of five years discussion on this issue. And I know tonight everybody's here to talk about it. But if there's something that's been discussed in the past. I want to bring it to your attention. Um, there's comments and discussion about if you want certain regulations, you live in a subdivision with deed restrictions. Okay. And you heard Dr. Harmon refer to zoning. Zoning regulations and land use are changed in every community across this country all the time. It's not stagnant. It changes with the communities as they change. Gulf County is changing. So do the land use regulations. And so it's not impermissible. It's not illegal for you all to look at the issues and as the county grows, adapt your land development regulations to it. We have homeowners associations. They say you can and can't do certain things. You buy it with the understanding that you're allowed to do certain things or build a certain way. Unincorporated Gulf County that is not in subdivisions or HOAs, they have board of directors for their HOAs. You are the board of directors for this community and the unincorporated uh, portions of Gulf County. That is why you have a comp plan and that is why you have LDRs. Those are your restrictions and you are able to change them from time to time. You did it tonight with Leave No Trace. You did it tonight with LDR. 
And so you as a board of directors look at the issue and you have the ability. There's issues of zoning. We bring it up. Commissioners, you all have your feelings on zoning. So do the community. Right now, short of zoning, this is an issue to put a regulation in place. As, I, as you have it in front of you right now, we've covered, I said, the entire spectrum. What you have in front of you is you have various options. Okay? There's a balance, and I keep going back to it. We talk about balance on all these ordinances, on all these resolutions, and all these policies you all adopt. The balance in this is striving that the state law requires everybody in this county to build a certain way for public safety. Everyone. By law. And our county enforces it. Vehicles or non-permanent structures along this corridor have no regulations. They're not required. They're also not built nor intended for permanent dwelling. The county allows it for recreational vehicles. The regulations that is in front of you right now, and everyone in this room, I presume, owns property, either a home or an RV or a parcel in Gulf County. And what you have in front of you, that one piece of paper versus the old ordinance and the new one, addresses everyone in Gulf County has purchased a piece of property, will continue to be able to use an RV anywhere in the county. And your LDRs apply as they do today. They'll apply tomorrow. Setbacks, parking spaces. But I go back to the balance issue, and I'm only addressing it because it's been five years of discussion. The homeowners all built to a, a state law, and there's nothing with regards to a dwelling on a property without a state Florida building code structure. And so that balance that I'm speaking of is the original ordinance that you have in front of you speaks about evacuating for six months. Now it says evacuate for only the few days per year that you have inclement weather that is not built to state law. So there's a balance, and it's homeowners versus recreational vehicles. If you define the quarter within a mile and the state law tells us all we have to build a certain way, to Mr. Arnold's point, you are the board of directors. You do set the land use regulations in this county. You do define what can and can't for the better betterment of the public policy. You have under Statute 125 the ability to do these things. And the one page in front of you now speaks to everyone in this county can continue to come. Anybody that purchases a piece of property after today can still come with an RV. They'll have to get a recreational vehicle use, and they can use it for up to a month. Anybody that purchased prior to today that's in this room can continue to come. The only thing that this ordinance asks is that they respect the public safety and the evacuation of a non-permanent structure within this corridor. And then when it's gone, they can bring it back, and they can register it once a year. And those three are the only three requirements in that piece of paper in front of you. And, and Mr. Chairman, so, yeah, okay. and, they, and they continue to have that right until they transfer title or pass away. Or don't evacuate. And if they don't evacuate, could we, could we put in that the first time it's a fine? And then the second time, it's a loss of the. Because my, I am concerned that we may be the cause of them not being able to get in here and evacuate. I have been in evacuation zones, and you cannot get in sometimes. And if we create that issue, then I, I would be concerned that we prevent them from coming in. And, and I wanted to clarify something, too, um, with Dr. Hardman. And I don't know if I understood you correctly. But when I said that they should be able to have a new RV, my point is if they already have a lot and they're grandfathered in, that I don't think we should incentivize them to have to stay in an old RV and they should be able to have a new RV until they lose their grandfather. Okay, I just okay. want to make sure that I didn't misunderstand you. Okay. They're grandfathered in for an RV on their property just, until yeah. they do. Right, but I don't, I don't agree with you. I, and I don't agree with new property owners. I just wanted to make sure we were clear. It, it, Mr. Chairman, right, let me go back here. To your point, it would be to the – we heard a comment two weeks ago about someone wanting to upgrade. It would be to the use. And your grandfathered in as long as you purchase property. You could continually use it for recreational vehicle and upgrade and buy a new one, bring another one in each year, as long as you register it when you come down each year. Okay. Or if you leave it here all year round and we have no evacuations, you can leave it on that property all year. Um, and if you leave and you come on the weekend and then you leave and you and the RV is there and you're not in it, no then we're okay. Yeah. And I just offer this for your consideration, Commissioner. You're talking about if they don't come down, other communities in Florida, there are in businesses where you sign a contract and you say, you've got to move it. I can't get there. I'm in Wisconsin. Um, and there's also our special mag magistrate, Ms. Shailene Grover. She's going to hear these, and so when we enforce it, we go before her. She makes a final ruling. Okay, so they're um, going to have redress. And okay. they'll have an opportunity to say, 
I had a contract in place, and it was a breach of contract, and I did everything with due diligence and for public safety, and I paid someone to do this. And then the judge has the opportunity to take those mitigating circumstances into consideration, but it shows that they had the public safety concern. They also have the ability, and the county also has the exemption and the hardship. So there's outlets for the county to deal with special fact patterns than just someone not evacuating and staying in their RV. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, I think we're pretty much here. We're good. We'll out. Press one, maybe two at the most. We're going over the same repetition. Come on. Uh -huh. I don't want to get this thing so mushroomed out that we just can it and back here five years from now. Don't lie. Are you all back before I know you're back before you say mushroom. Okay. okay. Jeremy, a little clarification if you don't mind. So if someone buys a lot right now, they can put an RV pad on it and bring their RV back and forth. Yes. So there's exactly. no restriction on it. Uh, until we adopt we this ordinance. It. No, no, okay. I mean, but with a new or I'm talking about if we pass the ordinance. That will prohibit that in the future. Well, Dawn, it depends on what they adopt tonight. I mean, so what you what you proposed, what you proposed. Would they be able to come and go? Yes. So would a new person person be able oh, to I'm buy sorry. a lot and put sorry. a after today? Feedback? If someone, the, the the whole issue, Dawn, and it's for the public, is constructive notice. And there's people saying, "I bought here ten years ago." You got emails. I bought here thirty years ago. I bought here ten days ago. When they bought, they say, "My realtor advertised it this way," or "I was told one thing." The Gulf County doesn't advertise and market properties, okay? So that's private business. But going forward, this board then says you're on constructive notice that Gulf County now has an amended ordinance and an LDR that says these are the regulations going forward. So anybody after today, if they adopted that, would be prohibited from placing permanently an RV within a mile of the coast, barring the 28 days that they could come down under permits in the county. Okay, but this is, this is, the, this is where we're not clear. So, but they they could come down and put an RV on that for two weeks. They could drive down and use that for two yes, weeks. Yes, But that's, that's our problem. That's where we're losing our tax dollars. That's our tax base. I, I, think, I think what we're trying to do is get something in place, Don, and, and that's what Franklin County does too. I mean, we looked at other counties, surrounding counties. They allow somebody, if they purchase that property, and they want to place an a RV on it for two weeks, they allow them to do it for two weeks. I think this one says... Is it 30 days? It's two 14-day permits. Two 14-day permits. All you're allowing them to do is use their, their, their lot uh, twice, that's twice a year. year. Yeah, it's not like they're coming up and, and permanently setting up a, a an RV and living in them like they can now. And so we're starting with that restriction. But would they be able to put up a new RV pole on that lot to service that for two weeks? Or they just come and stay somewhere for two weeks. I mean, isn't that kind of the issue yes. that it becomes? I hear people use the term RV lot, and there is no such thing as an RV lot. There's a lot that has an RV or um, items on it that accommodate an RV, but RV lots are only lots that are in RV parks or RV um, subdivisions. So we have lots that have RV poles, I believe that we call them. And so my question would be, after this, um, if this is passed, could someone buy a lot and put an RV pole on to come and park there two weeks or whatever the provision adds for? Under what I provided to you right now, the answer would be, it, if someone comes to Gulf County after today and purchases a lot within a mile of the coast, they are clearly on notice that it is for recreational purposes only up to 28 days a year. And no, there's, pole, there's no pole because the people with permanent residence in RVs in Gulf County are people that own and use them prior to or today or okay. prior. And those people are grandfathered for that permanent dwelling, if you will. And then they're the only ones allowed to do that because they purchased the property prior to this going through. So the permits that we were talking about, they're really for visitors or, you know, my son comes by and likes to visit me for two weeks in his RV. It's more for that type of use. The the permits that you provided for, the two-week permits, Recre the Rec two recreational 14-day permits, that's really for someone who comes in and visits in an RV. Okay. I think, isn't that what you're getting at? Is it, some, is it a permanent? <laughs> Don, I think what you're wanting, the way I understand what you're wanting, 
is that... Not just me. I understand. Let's back up just a minute. We had at the CCA meeting on Saturday, I actually stood at the door and tried to catch as many people coming in the door to get their opinion on what they wanted. And overwhelming, everybody that walked through the door, except for three people that abstained, was, you know, we want an ordinance. You know, we need restrictions. We don't want RV lots up and down Cape San Blas Road. And I'm sure all of our beaches are the same way. Indian Pass, they're all feeling the same way. So what can we do to protect our, our, our tax base is my big thing. You know, we've got our tax base and we've got the safety. We've got lots of issues here. But I think that, you know, I think how we support our whole county is at, as at risk here because we have, you know, polls out there and then we have, um, you know, a pole with a shower head on it so right next to it. You know, and so that's, and they come and they park and, you know, and it's okay. I mean, it, you, you're allowed to use your RV. I love RVs too, but, you know, to have it set up next to a $800,000 house that's bringing in TDC dollars and tax dollars. Uh, you know, and, and, and per, you know, you know, I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a huge value to our economy. And, you know, we need to protect that. You know, that's, that's a, if we start our, and I talked to an appraiser two weeks ago myself at a property, and he said, you know, we've got a problem. You know, and he, he's a resident of our county, and he also said, you know, we've got to do something because, you know, we're, this is a huge tax base we have here, and we've got to protect it. So, um, can't think of anything else. But, you know, it's, oh, and the other, okay, we'll have one more thing. So if you, if okay, you, you got about four seconds. We'll okay. So if you have one part, can you come and go on the weekend still? Yeah. Yes. Yes. Uh, if you're in the grandfather clause, you can come and go. Okay. Yep. Until, until you lose it. I think the idea is that when we grandfather folks in, we have to make it where they can function. It's not right for us to make it so stringent that these folks that have come here and they have their RVs, they've done what they were supposed to do. We cannot make it so stringent that they cannot function. Let me go over here. Uh, Mr. Tarney, did you want to make a comment here? No, sir. Oh, yeah, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm just All right, I'm going to introduce you. One more. I think we've uh, going to wind up killing this thing. What's going to happen? Who wants to come? Come on, young lady. Laurie Digby. How are you? Okay. Um, thank you for hearing me. Um, I sympathize. I understand if I have a million dollar home. I understand what you're saying. I live in Highland View. We chose to live in that area. Um, um, I did a real quick assessment of all the property in my block and the blocks and my vacant lot with a motor home on, I mean with my camper on it is really, you know, has a higher tax base assessment than the, some of the properties in my area. We have wonderful neighbors. They embraced us when we came. They look after our place. They gave us gifts. They're good people. And it's, it's, it's a poor little community, but they're good people. And um, we chose to live in that area. We followed all the rules and regulations. I'm a school teacher, and this is my haven for sanity on the weekend. I just want to come sleep in my camper that's on my property on the weekends. I want to fish in the bay and just enjoy the county. I don't have the money to stay in your homes for a week or a day, and I can't afford property on your land. I'm just asking that in Highland View, in my little piece of the world, where I have finally been able to spend my retirement money, that I'm allowed to come and just enjoy my piece of property. And I appreciate Jeremy for all the work that he's done on this to try to meet us in the middle on this. Um, the only thing I'm a little worried about is that, you know, I'm getting on up there a few years and I hope I can survive my last three years of teaching and get down here and retire. But when I pass on, I'd love for my kids to be able to come on. We've raised our kids as Boy Scouts and Girl Scouts. And I don't know how to ride an elevator to a high rise. i got to keep my feet on the ground and my face in the sun. And I just I want to be able to just pass it on to my kids if that's at all possible. But if it's not, I'll put a note on you. I just thank you for your time and your consideration and all the work you've done. I really do. This gentleman here in the blue shirt. Here. 
Thank you, Commissioners. Clay Lewis, 4452 Cape Sand Blast Road. Could I Here, Clay. give these to you before my time starts? <laughs> Share one, get one over there today. Or one if we. Thanks, Clay. Hey, Clay, what? Uh, wait a minute. Uh, reset the time. It's been running here. He had to start. Is a certain page you want to start on here? Um, we can follow along with you. Actually, I gave Mr. Novak my copy of those oh, pages. Yeah. So, <laughs> uh, <laughs> we've heard a lot about uh, opinions on values and and how values are assessed and this, that, and the other. I've got some some properties here that the first property is uh, directly across the street from mine. Um, it just sold on 922 at a, one of the highest prices per square foot uh, after the post recession. Um, it's road front. Uh, the second property is a beachfront house that is not visible of any campers whatsoever. Um, it's uh, probably 25% less and probably 25% more square footage. In the, in the same location? Uh, no, this is about a mile down the road. Uh, Braden Post. The, the, the sales price is on there. Um, the, third, the third property and the fourth property are owned by the same individual. Um, the, the third piece of paper um, is his house. The, the next adjoining lot uh, he actually bought uh, for an RV lot and has developed an RV lot on that parcel uh, with y'all's permission. Um, I don't think somebody would buy a property and put a put an RV lot next to them if it was directly uh, affecting their property values negatively. There are a lot of things that affect property values. For instance, the lack of a beach, FEMA, lack of having FEMA, um, you know, beach erosion, foreclosures. There are many, many, many things that affect value. Um, many of the houses in this county that were built in the 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s were not structured under today's building code. They are just as vulnerable, if not much more so, than the RVs that are located in this county. Personally, my RV or ARV on my lot has been there almost 20 years and never been moved. So the history tells me, and I, I, you know, I'm going to move for the storm too. But you know, the, those RVs could be tied down just like mobile homes that weren't weren't uh, um, regulated back in the in the 60s, 70s, 80s, all that kind of stuff. The other thing that that uh, I see is that the grandfather clause has been very restrictive. One, one small other piece. What? You're standing up very tight. <laughs> um, I, I heard. Okay, you want to get a motion to grant him some more time? Not. Look, let me finish this thought. All right, all right. Go on through your train here. We'll give you a minute. Okay. This was unworkable last time. And I feel that's unworkable this time. And I think that it needs to be thrown out just like the last time. Thank you. Maybe um, Commissioner McLemore would like to uh, approach those areas one at a time. And maybe we can carve some of those areas out. I can do that. Please get started there. Do we want to do that now? Well, yeah, let me just let me make Please. a comment, and then we can do that now, if you don't mind, Mr. Chairman. I, I, 
this issue was tough four years ago, and it's tough now, and it's an issue that we have just got to address. I mean, there's no question we have got to do something. We can't allow it. We've heard for the past couple of public hearings, and believe me, I've heard on the telephone and through email a lot of different opinions, and I told the Coastal Community Association Saturday, you know, there's a lot of different people living in this county, and I can tell you, you've got a lot of different ideas about what we should do and what we shouldn't do. So it's going to be tough. No matter which way this board goes, some people aren't going to be happy with it, and some people are, or maybe nobody will be happy with it, but it will be a happy medium, hopefully. And that's what we're trying to get to. And I think, to be honest with you, what the attorney has drafted here through these public hearings and through these emails, really it touches to all the issues. I've always been a guy, I think, that I want as limited government intervention in my life as I can possibly have. However, sometimes government has to intervene to protect the rights of all the residents, and that's what we're trying to do here. So I would think that, Mr. Chairman, we could actually take this particular page, address Mr. McLemore's issues about which ones that he wants to carve out, and then take this page and adopt this as we see, as we stand with this. And I would just say, you know, we've heard all the opinions. Every one of us could get up here and talk an hour about this. And I believe that I've heard so many different opinions, I could argue both sides. I could do that. But I'm ready, and I think that we need to do something moving forward. And, you know, that's just my thoughts. And I think the attorney wanted to say something about that. I'm ready to move on this. Just one general comment. If you're going to make discussions about right now you've defined one mile from the mean high water. As your attorney, I'm going to offer the comments to you, and then you all define what public safety and the whereas clauses in the first two and a half pages apply or don't apply. One thing I want to caution you all against is we heard the word zoning. One thing I want to caution you against is spot zoning. First and foremost, you pick and choose places. If you pick and choose places, I'd ask the commission to justify it, to say that these areas that you're pulling out, if you do, don't apply for the same flooding and wind events that you're applying it to. And so if you make the motion to pull them out, if you can justify them, to distinguish them under your whereas clauses. Right now you've defined a mile inland on the coast of Gulf County because of wind flood events. If you pull out areas within that mile corridor now, I'd ask you just to justify that those areas are not distinguished from the areas of concern for flood and wind and water events. And just for public policy, I'd ask you that we're not spot zoning in Gulf County. We're actually distinguishing those areas that they're not the same vulnerability. Jeremy, let me ask you. Okay, go ahead. I'm sorry. Question for the attorney. Yes, sir. Would Cape Sand Blast fit into that picture for Highland View? Oak Grove? All of Cape Sand Blast, all of Highland View, all of Oak Grove are within that mile corridor. Would that give us leeway to pull those out? Yeah, that is for you five to decide. That's why I'm asking you all to give us that interpretation. I'm no weatherman. Yes, sir. And that's why I'm saying if you're going to take a defined area within a mile along Gulf County, it's universally applied to the entire county. If you're going to pull provisions out, then I'm asking the commission to state affirmatively that you're distinguishing a portion of the coastline is different than another portion of the coastline in terms of vulnerability. Okay, I hear you. I hear you. I got it now. I got it. I know how to do it. You know how to do it? Oh, are you fixing to make a motion? I know you've got one motion on the table, and I'm going to have to pull it, but I want to make another motion. I know what he wants. I'm scared. I just want to add one more provision to that. Earlier we just discussed leave no trace and LDRs, and we talked about litigation. The county's vulnerability. In 19 years we had one suit that came up on the LDRs. We're moving forward. You adopted the LDRs. I'm as your attorney. Obviously we don't want to expose the county to future suit. We have one on that past ordinance. On this I'm saying in terms of spot zoning, those are things that can be challenged by property owners. If there is a distinction between universally applying this and picking spots throughout the county. So in terms of I'd ask you for clear justifications as to if you're going to go beyond the mile to what those are so I can then defend it going forward. May I? I don't 
I think that we have to have some you're saying clear justifications, but you mean that they have to be actual justifications that we know. We can't just say that that it's justified. It you're saying it has to be justified. We, so we need to be very cautious with that. I have no knowledge. Yeah. Commission. Maybe another commissioner on this board does, but I have no knowledge that carves those out um, because of tides or I just don't have that knowledge. Four, four years ago, this commission applied the tourist corridor to this application because you had to find an area in the county of the main corridors, and you said that's not applicable. Okay, they came back, and the building department, the planning department, have all now applied this. And the zone is defined by your Florida building code. They applied it from Florida statute and Florida administrative code. So you're saying, how do you distinguish it? So the county came back, and the staff now they're defining it by Florida statute. That mile is defined and supported by something on the books. And you all clarified that tonight. If you go beyond that now, I'm asking, that's where we're going back outside that clarification, and that's what I need from this commission. What is the justification beyond the Florida Building Code for why you're doing that? Okay. That, Mr. Chairman, may I? Yep. Uh, let me do this. Uh, I'm listening. <laughs> I, I, I want to I put my original motion. My original motion was to exclude Highland View, Oak Grove and Money Bow. Uh, Simmons Bow. Simmons Bow. That was my original motion. Which okay. included Jones Homestead. Jones right? Homestead, yeah. Let's throw that out the window. What I'd like to do now, is, and I'll put this on a motion, we'll do it one at a time. We'll do, we'll do, uh, I'd like to exclude Highland U because the, the peninsula helps Take the wind zone. When when we have major flooding, we have an intercoastal waterway there that the waters come up through the intercoastal. Mr. Turner, you listen to this? Yes, sir. <laughs> <laughs> so are those justifications? So that's my motion. We have the intercoastal. We have the we have the peninsula for protection. I, I just is that is that true? Okay. <laughs> Can I ask a question? In terms of the again, as an attorney, when you transfer title to property you have legal meets and bounds. You know the four corners of a piece of property or three corners of a property, whatever it may be. My question then is we know a mile from the mean high water is a clearly defined universal application. If you're gonna say that there's three neighborhoods in Gulf County, I know historically we all know Simmons Bayou, we all know Highland View, we all know Oak Grove. It's unincorporated Gulf County. If there is four corners that define those, then that is easily enforced and interpreted. If there isn't, then I'd ask the county commission to provide the staff with what are the four corners of Simmons Bayou. And that, and that, so we need that clarity because right now what we're doing is we have a clear line, and if we go outside that, I'd ask the commission to provide us with that, that, that legal description of that property is. You don't, you've got me so confused, I'm going to tell you, I sat here five years ago when I went through all of this, and I finally made a motion to throw it all out the window, and that's what I'm fixing to make now. Yeah. This, I, I Mr. Here. Chairman, if, if I may, I, you know, I've made all, I'm going to take heat for this anyway. You, you dice it because, because my, my district and, and Commissioner Three's district is most affected by this. But we have got to do something. This is a good addition to what we've done. We've, we've provided that everybody is, is, is uh, grandfathered in. For those folks that have come down and spent the $10,000 that they did for their sewer system and the water and all those kinds of things and made their uh, lot nice, we've provided uh, you with an, with an out here. We've grandfathered you in. You can continue to use your, uh, to use your property as you, as you bought it. And, and that's the most fairest thing that I think that we can do. I don't even know if Franklin County did that. So we're providing the grandfather clause. With this, with this other uh, addition, which, which basically the public doesn't have, but you read, Jeremy, it fits in with everything that I can think of that the public discussed and their concerns and those type things. So I'm going to put a, form of, uh, uh, a motion on that we adopt this ordinance with the changes, with this one-page change that uh, our, our attorney put in 
and let's move forward with this. And there is no doubt, six months down the road, we're going to look at this and we're going to say, you know what, we need to adjust this or we need to do this or we need to do that, and we can with public input. But we've provided for everybody an out. Everybody that had a concern, we've provided you an out. And I think we've got to pre uh, prevent future developments of just RV lots in this coastal zone or in this one-mile zone. And with that, uh, my motion stands as, as, as stated. Right. And Mr. Chairman, okay. I would like to second that motion, but ask for the addition of the Corporation LLC and Trust language to um, Subdivision A. That, that's fine. I, I'll that, that, that they in. cannot. I, if I can, the, the, the grandfather would be to specific individual names, not corporate entities. So if someone okay. does hold in the corporate name, if I can add just a suggestion that on the application for the permit in that first year, it defines who the individual is that's receiving that grandfather provision instead of a corporation with 25 corporate members. That's fine, provided we have that language to secure that. If you would that, just that's, amend. That's fine. Okay, in my second stance, thank you. Yeah. Any further board discussion? I don't like it. I don't think it's fair. I will not support the presentation. Okay. All right, any, uh, yeah. He withdrew it. He withdrew the other No, she's right. I withdrew one motion. I made another motion. Oh, which one? Yes. I did. What was the other one? What was the other one? It was, let's hold up here. we got to get this clarified. You made a motion strictly for Holland View. Absolutely. And gave my explanation like the attorney asked for. Right. But I, I'm just saying there's still a motion on the floor. All right. There's a second then to Commissioner McLemore's motion to exclude Holland View. I hear a motion. Exclude Highland View. Not motion fails for lack of a second. Let me, let me restate again. We're protecting Highland View. We are protecting the people of Highland View, and we're protecting the people of, of Oak Grove, and, and we're protecting the people of St. Joe Beach and all over. We're, we're giving them with the grandfather clause, and because of that, I, I'm, I'm good with this. We've got to do something. I'll take the heat for it, and, and I make that motion that we proceed with, with this, with this one-page addition. And I will second it, and we are protecting Highland View, and we cannot, our attorney just advised us that we cannot arbitrarily spot carve uh, someone out of an ordinance. But we cannot do it. Um, so I'm going to second uh, Commissioner Yeager's motion. Let me uh, make a comment before I go to the public on that. Well, three years ago we were here. We killed it because... We can hear one of their little rules and regulations, and we move on down to uh, Angel Beach. They want their little world. Highland View wanted their little world. Oak Grove wanted theirs. The Cape wanted theirs. Indian Pass. So we just said, that's it. You've got to come up with something universal. You start slicing out, they're protected. Mr. said, you wind up in a bunch of lawsuits. This place said, wait a minute. You gave it to them. Why not us? You know, we, we're just as important as they are. So we need to keep it universal here. We can always go back and address some of these. Why not go on to the north end of the county then, Mr. McDaniel? What? Do the whole county. We'll, we'll do that. Do now. the whole county. Well, the, uh, and, and the grandfather clause has been expanded. So you are not going to be, that you have to be in there. You have to be in there continually. You can't leave and come back. That All of that is relaxed. So if you are here in your RV, you can function with your RV. You can go back to Georgia or Alabama, and you could come here and enjoy your RV. That is all in place here. And I'm, I'm certain if this motion passes that our attorney will revise the ordinance, and it will be available on the website for everyone to see. I'll put a vote, Mr. Chairman. All right. I've got to go here. Any more board discussion? Any public discussion? Public comment. Me and my wife own Wait a minute, you gotta to come to the podium. If me and my wife own our lot in Highland View together. If Name. I die before hers Name, sir. Name, sir. Paul Digby in Highland View. If me and my wife own the lot together, if I die, which is more likely than her, she's got to move off. No. Oh. No. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Okay. 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 Mr. Mr. Joint tenancy. Um, Joint tenancy. We'll put a provision right. in there. Okay. Yes. That's in the motion. 
And, it, and if, if two folks own the lot now, even if it's, um, you know, it doesn't have to be a husband and wife. If two people are on the title now and they both own the RV, then one dies, one still owns the lot and the RV. So you're still there. I appreciate y'all uh, letting me come up again, and I also appreciate y'all spending as much time on this because it is a very important decision. Um, one of the questions I had, I kind of agree with Carmen a little bit, and maybe just throw this thing out, but it don't seem like that's going to happen because we do need some rules and regulations. I think I heard Mr. Yeager a couple of, uh, maybe December the 8th meeting y'all had somewhere about then that said y'all had ordinances, but you never enforced them. Why don't you go back to doing that? Why don't you start with that? <laughs> That's what's you know? We can't enforce Y'all can't enforce what y'all had. Why y'all want to do something else? <laughs> Other thing I had for uh, Miss Bryan, she keeps bringing up this trust. And I, I don't know how many people out here belong to a trust or a part of a trust or got a trust. But I don't think I understand what you're saying when you're saying don't let a trust do something. I, I, I don't understand because a trust is a trust is a trust. And I mean, these people set up a trust. Great grandma set up a trust. I can explain. Okay. Don't take this out of my mouth. Right. Take your Hold his time. I, you, want, you want to address this, Mr. Attorney, on this? You, you can you you I'm just trying to understand now. I ain't right. making trouble. I'm just trying you, to understand because I'm involved in this. The county, and, uh, for grandfathering purposes, are going to identify the individuals who own the property, not an entity formed or a corporation nor a trust. Trust is you, John, and a sibling, then the sibling, the, the grandfather provision applies to those two individual names. But it doesn't say well, the trust. You the trust didn't to me. It's a trust that somebody else set up. Now I'm a trustee. I can't touch the money. I, mean, I can't do nothing. The trust doesn't, I don't get nothing out of the trust. I'm just a trustee on a trust. And it would be the beneficiary. Uh, the, the point is that Lawyers find ways around everything. And, <laughs> and you know, I, I can place my property into a trust and have it continue on and on. Same thing with an LLC, that if I have it in an LLC, that I can transfer title. I can transfer my LLC to you, and the title on the land didn't change, but I sold you my LLC and you got my lot because it is an asset of the LLC. Because that's the law. So, right, that is the law. So when we're drafting this ordinance, the point of the grandfather clause is that it's personal to you or you and your wife or you and your brother or whoever is on title. But if you had it in an LLC and you and your brother, let's say, owned it, and you transferred, if you transferred your LLC, not the title to the land, but the LLC to Mr. Novak and Mr. Butler, then you transferred title, but the t name on the title didn't change. And we don't want to provide that as a loophole. It's closing a loophole. Well, I kind of understand what you say, but just like you all mentioned earlier, that you've got situations and different e events that require different rules and regulations. So this is actually a... Uh, educational trust. So I doubt I'm going to benefit much from that because, you know, I mean, I'm not really a beneficiary. It's an uh, uh, educational but trust, even though there are properties involved in the trust. And if it becomes but, an issue for you, you can go through the process in front of Ms. Grover as uh, Mr. Novak was. Okay, don't cut me off because I think everybody's going to want to know this one. This doesn't deal with me individually. Okay. I got another question. Mr. Novak had mentioned when somebody sells their lot, then that doesn't carry over. Okay, I understand that. Talking about the grandfather. The grandfather. We keep talking about this grandfather, and when they sell that lot, it doesn't go. So then your new regulations come in on that lot. Okay, understood. Okay, now what about this guy? Now he's grandfathered in. Well, what about the guy that's bought the lot for an RV, and his RV's not on there yet? But he bought that RV because you just said when it, I'm sorry, Mr. Novak just said when it sells. It didn't say nothing about when they bought, he, no, I'm sorry, I take that back. When he said when they bought a lot, they were under the understanding that that was the new rules. Okay. What about if they already own it? Or is it, as he said, as he explained it to this group of people here, that it's when he 
when they sell that lot or it changes hands, then the regulation takes effect. But he didn't say nothing about before. So there's a wide open thing right there that wasn't answered at all. If you own a piece of property in Gulf County today, you're grandfathered. If you buy it tomorrow, you're no longer grandfathered. Great. I just want to make that clarified to everybody here. Okay. So they can still get their RV and put it on their property. I've got a call. All right? Okay. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. 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 Thank
And we, we're, not bringing the, we're not bringing the value of the property down. We're bringing it up. You, you do know, as proposed, you're going to continue to be able to do that as long as I you and your husband will. I understand that, but okay. I still know that future reasons there won't be any, there will not be any way to do that. I, I'll be honest with you. I wanted to carve out uh, Oak Grove and Highland View, but it seems like on the advice of the attorney that if we do that, that's going to open up a challenge to the whole. There's thing. a way that it can be done. And I bet he can do it because, uh, like you said, lawyers can do things that go around things <laughs> that can be done, and I promise you. That there can be a reason why the Oak Grove and Highland View can be excluded without it being an issue. And, and now I had to do it. I'm not done it. Well, that I'm sorry, but I had to say it, and I couldn't sleep tonight if I hadn't gotten up here. I'm not a person that can speak in front of people, but I do have to tell you my heart, and we are just excited to be where we are, and we want to stay there. And my children come here every year to go to Camp Sandblast, and they camp out, and we have done it for uh, ever since my kids have been married, and they, they want to come and enjoy ourselves and be a, have a family, right. my grandchildren, and everything else. And that's all i got to say. One more. I'm on it. We've heard no money. Are you calling for the vote? I will. I'm vice chairman. Are you passing the chair over to me? I'm just asking. <laughs> call for the vote here. I, I'm ready. Here all night. Yeah. Plus, I'll address, I'll I recognize you, and that's it. I appreciate it. That's all. I really think, I think everybody's got the opinion. You may see some of the time. The reality of it is, is that... You wait a minute. Tell her who Dave you are. Dave Smith, 9317 Old Avenue. You know, when we first started this tonight... We were to vote on all this, okay? And then what happened is we voted on the one mile before we even talked about any of this. And I don't know if that's procedurally correct or not, because it automatically knocks out Carmen's possibilities. If we made this all sandblast because of the egress issue with one road, it could have been just sandblast. It wouldn't have to be a mile, you know? And then we could have segmented the county because of that, not because of the hurricane. But just that egress will be the hurricane, you know, the possibility. We could have done that and then kept all this over here for the RVers. And I don't know if that procedure is correct by circumventing part of it to begin with without hearing the comments from the public. You, you see what I'm saying? I, I, I just don't know. But I just want to put that out there. I'm calling for the vote, Mr. Chairman. Hey, all right. I'm calling for the vote. We're going to vote on this. Uh, all right, let's... I'll tell you one thing. Clarification. Restate. Uh, Reread the motion. The motion is to adopt the ordinance with the uh, one page addition that Jeremy Novak presented tonight. Attorney presented. The motion was by Commissioner Dega. Am I correct? The second correct. by uh, Commissioner Bryan. All right. We heard it. The motion's on the floor. Is there any objection to the motion? Yes. All right. Any yeah, further objections? Right, the motion passes for. Okay. All right. I need a motion to adjourn, Mr. Chairman. Uh, yeah. <laughs> You're going anyway. <laughs> yeah, I'm going. <laughs>